Tradoon.
it squashed completely flat, the bone wall is so thin, it's about the same dimension as the wall of a dirter. A dirter is one of those things you get at the end of the paper towels, the cardboard thing in the middle, you go dirt, dirt, dirt in it. Well, that's what this thing is like. Dirter. Dirt, dirt, dirt. Dirter.
don't think it's a computer. Yeah, it's good shape, too. It's five, six feet high. I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extraordinary... What did you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Oh, they got it in for me. <laughs> and look at the half-moon-shaped bones on the wrist. It's no one of these guys learn how to fly. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. That Could doesn't look very scary. <laughs> More like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> turkey, huh? Turkey. Six-foot turkey. Turkey, huh? Six-foot turkey. Okay. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. <gasps> Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. You get your first look at this six foot turkey as you enter it clear. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. Oh, I'm glad you're here today. Happy Thursday to you. Happy Thursday Birds Day to you. And happy Velociraptor Awareness Day today. I'm not sure where this holiday originated, but it is celebrated across the internet. And it's a wonderful excuse for us to talk about one of the most misunderstood dinos dinosaurs in popular culture, Velociraptor mongoliensis. We'll be talking today about why the Velociraptors from Jurassic Park are not actually Velociraptor. We'll be talking about what they actually are and why. We'll be talking about what Velociraptor was really like. We'll be talking about the, uh, the impact of those films on the public consciousness, on their understanding of dinosaurs. We'll be talking about the whole family of, of dromaeosaurs, the family that Velociraptor belongs to, what makes them special, and all that good stuff. So I hope you're as excited for that as I am. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. And uh, if anybody is new here, allow me to introduce myself real quick. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. So uh, talking about my field of specialty. As a paleontologist, I study fossils. As a dinosaur paleontologist, I study dinosaur fossils in particular. Most paleontologists don't work on dinosaurs, but I do, as you can probably guess, looking at my office here. Um, I study dinosaurs, I publish on them in the scientific literature, I talk about dinosaurs five days a week, and I am going to be out digging dinosaurs again very soon. Uh, a little over a month from now, like a month and one week, something like that. I'm going to be leaving for the field out in the wilds of western Wy Western Wyoming, yeah. Oh, and hello, Minnie Pie. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Minnie. Uh, I owe you some treats, don't I? 
yes, indeed. Very excited to be out there again in the field, just like last summer. Here, let me get this set up for viewing here. There we go. Hello, Mini Pie. Hello, hello. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, like it has been in past streams? Let me know. But welcome, Reaper Extra, Ghostly Ghoul. Thank you for the six months of support. Yeah, anyway. Crack yeah, let's get to the intro here. I publish on them in the scientific literature. Oh, I already said And that. nowadays, I actually make oh, my living Mini here Pie. on Twitch, streaming <laughs> paleontology, um, usually five days a week. But I'm out here in the late Cretaceous Almond Formation. Have good, been man? for a little over a week now. And uh, I can't stream every day because this is a real working dinosaur dig. You know, we're digging up new specimens. It's a lot of hard work. We've I'm been be dealing with as close to every day times. as I can. This and it's unpredictable out here in the field. So uh, I've been doing the best I can. But luckily today, it is a beautiful day. It is not raining, as you can see. Yeah, look at that not uh, rain there. Nice temperature. It's in the 70s today. <laughs> I figured it's yeah. a perfect day to stream. Yeah. We're digging up a duck billed dinosaur just over this ridge, and I'll show you that in a couple minutes here. Um, Tarzan says, how goes the Ceratopsian dig? Anyway. Uh, about how we... Like, maybe 30... Yeah. Would go through. This Fisher showing off some of the... Uh, awesome. Some the hadrosaur... Vertebrae. Got this. Vertebral probably. pieces Okay. Oh, my goodness. Siasank. Thank you for the raid. Scientific welcome to Paleontologizing, Siasank. Scientific are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing, and happy Velociraptor Awareness Day to you, Siasank. Hello, hello. How are things? Uh, from launch to raptors, we're diving from game launches to dinosaur facts. Syasank, thank you for bringing your viewers here. I hope you had a wonderful stream. What kind of a game launch were you doing? That sounds interesting. Momentous, even. If it's, uh, if it is what I think it is. Were you launching a new game? Very cool. Uh, Syasank, welcome, welcome. I don't know if we've got enough people in the chat to uh, enough new people to warrant a welcome video, but let me know if there are. Uh, we are just kind of getting started with Velociraptor Awareness Day today, aren't we, Mini Pie? Yeah, let's pull up the cat cam here. Yeah, it's called No Rest for the Wicked. It just came out today, but it isn't my game. Well, cool, Sia, I think it's still me. Do something about that. Oh, I think you might appreciate some treats. Would you appreciate some treats, Mini Pie? I think you might. Let's see, do that. are very low calorie and they're good for her teeth so the vet recommended i give her a bunch so yeah your uh, your tweet treat quota has gone up mini pie the rent has been raised apparently and i'm happy to pay it <laughs> for once <laughs> yeah and please gravity mr andusa is my father's name call me dan Oh, mini pie. Yeah. Hey, Grim Deviant. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's uh, it's good to have everybody. I'm glad you could join us. Um, let's go through chat real quick, and we'll say hello to everybody. I saw Matt M33 was first today. How are you doing, Matt? Welcome, welcome. Kodali, right behind. How are you doing, Kodali? You two are always first. I appreciate that. Uh, Golganek, what is shaking with you? It's good to have you here, as always, Golganek. Um, 
And Niffler, how are you doing? Hello, hello. Filthy Badger, it's good to see you too. And Paleo Ken, it's Thursday, Bird's Day. Yeah, Velociraptor, Bird's Day. Yes, indeed, Ken. We'll actually be talking about how there is a chance that Velociraptor might legitimately be a bird. It could be that, that Manoraptor and dinosaurs in general might all be birds. Uh, we'll talk about that hypothesis a little bit. Chris T.S., how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. And Hard Treads, I'm excited to talk to you about why uh, why it is Deinonychus in Jurassic Park and not Velociraptor. But yeah, yeah Eddie Scarin. Uh, how are you doing? The Atrociraptors from Dominion should have been called Utah Raptors. Utah Raptor would have been bigger, though. Utah Raptor is a big animal. Um, and it doesn't have as short a snout as I remember those critters have. But we'll find out. Um, I might even have a chance to stream from the Utah Raptor block in Salt Lake this year, which would be pretty darn cool. Yeah. Um, Chalice of Choice, how are you doing? Hello, hello. MS Coggins, Rachidactylus, Tommy Platicus, go for Fluffernuts. And it then did. MS Coggins, Neilf, and Hugen, Gravity, and Danish Viking, Paleo Lord, and Fall Machine. It's good to have all of you here. Welcome. Welcome. Charlie's Dragon, how are you doing? And Verminitide Doug, birds being dinosaurs explains why cobra chickens are so violent. There's some, such a thing as a cobra chicken? Do they spit venom like their uh, snake namesake? <laughs> uh, good stuff. Uh, and there's Syasank with the raid too. Thank you again, Syasank. Real OG Tony, good to see you. Rachel Darling Endeavors, hello, hello. Uh, Timmer's Crutch and Seahorses Forever. I love your name, Seahorses Forever. That's good stuff. Um... Uh, Grim Deviant, hello, hello to you. Thing one of two, welcome back. I feel like it's been a minute. How are you doing, Thing? It's good to see you. Uh, and Sam wasn't it. Says happy Thursday, everyone. I am having a good day. I hope you are too, Sam. Groovy, how are you doing? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. And Marcy Walks Dog says hello. I'm chilling after a dinosaur rescue. I helped half my neighborhood corral a stray chicken to get it to safety. Marcy Walks Dogs. <laughs> Salute to you. Thank you for doing that. Doing your part to protect your neighborhood dinosaurs, Marcy Watts Dogs. Excellent. Yeah. Um, good work. Good work. And DJ Tyrannosaurus Flex says, yeah. How are you doing, DJ T-Rex? I hope things are good with you. It's good to have you back. It sounds like you're in the right place tonight. Back. T-Flex, I should say. Um, Mini Pie, what are you doing back there? You better not, you better not rip that Ethernet cable out of the wall, or, or we are gonna. That is not gonna be. Mini <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She didn't do it. <laughs> Oh, many. Oh, many. Yeah. Uh, anywho. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tolkien Otaku, welcome, welcome. How are you doing? And Dinosaur Dave, in terms of dirt roads, I was told I could get through. Uh, it was close a few times. I'm glad you got through, Dinosaur Dave. I'm glad you got through. Sorry, I've got cat hair all over my face now. Many pilot. Why would you do such a thing? <laughs> Judley61, how are you doing, Nibby? Uh, Gojira, Dr. Irrefutable, uh, Harry Vetch, Cosmic Seekin. Yeah, it's good to have you all here. Um, cat hair means you belong to her. Oh, yeah, oh, big time. Yeah, her and the other three cats. They, they all share me. Huh, Mini Pie? Yeah, my landlord's here. They lived here before I did. So I like you sitting there. That's good. That's a good spot for you, Minnie. I like that. It's not directly in front of the camera, but people still get to see your beautiful eyes there. And I'm sorry. There's it's going up my nose. It's stuck in my mustache. Minnie, oh my goodness. Oh, much hair. 
I gotta get one of those lint rollers just for my face. Yeah. And Mayor Space says, is there such a thing as a timed lock for a snack drawer that opens once a day? I'm sure there is. In fact, actually, during the trip to the vet, when I was there with the three cats, the vet said that you can get, like, RFID uh, cat feeders that will only activate when they detect the chip inside each of the different cats. So, like, if there's one cat who has difficulty getting enough food because the other cats are bullying that cat, you can get a feeder like that. It sounds expensive, but apparently that technology exists. Welcome to the future. Oh, Mini Pie, you're licking my hand. Yeah. Yeah, look at you, Mini Pie. How you doing? See the camera? Oh, is that tasty? Do I taste pretty good? on the move. Mini pie. <laughs> anyway, it's Velociraptor Awareness Day today. Um, much like Bat Appreciation Day, which was yesterday. I'm gonna do a quick search on YouTube and see if, uh, oh, Mini pie. Are you extra hungry today? Are you just waiting for me to keel over so you can devour me? Avian Manoraptorans do share more feature and body structure with avians than do with non Manoraptorans. Well, I mean, because birds are a kind of Manoraptoran, yeah, yeah. But that's the thing, is that where exactly did birds branch off? Was it before or after groups like the Deinonychosaurs split off? Because if it's before, and Deinonychosaurs actually come off of the avian branch, then that would mean that they are birds. So yeah. It's not really a question of how similar are they, it's more of a question of, of when did these different groups diverge. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be talking about that a little bit. Yeah. 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 Anywho. Um, oh, and is that right, Rachidactylus? A snack drawer for you? Have, you already have a snack drawer? Wow. I usually just don't buy snacks, and that's how I keep myself from eating too many snacks. You know, we ought to create some sort of health craze for celebrities where they drink smoothies uh, made from the hair of cats, and then I could be a millionaire. Start some sort of a I think get Gwyneth Paltrow in on that, you know? Just knock the mouse off my desk, maybe. What's that tan? Yeah. Um and Gojira, yeah, you gotta you gotta watch her. She's I wouldn't be brushing her for so long if she really needed it right now, so I appreciate it. Oh. Alright, that's my cue to, uh, to abstain for now. And CKO Studio, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. I'm uh, glad you clicked that follow button. Welcome to the channel. Um, Velociraptor Awareness Day. 
Do we have anything about that at all on YouTube? Just to kind of get us started here. Um... Yeah, it doesn't look like we really have anything. Which is okay. Um, that's fine. Kitty is hyped for raptor. Yes, she is indeed. Seahorses forever. Yeah. That's really interesting that the word raptor, before the publication of the novel Jurassic Park in the year 1990, the word raptor meant a bird of prey. It meant hawks and eagles, owls, and falcons, too, even though falcons are not close relatives. Falcons are actually closer to uh, closer to parrots on the Tree of Life than they are to hawks or eagles. Um, but really, the word raptor only became associated with dromaeosaurs, with, you know, that group of sickle-clawed dinosaurs after the publication of the novel Jurassic Park and then the movie Jurassic Park in 1993. Velociraptor was a pretty obscure dinosaur up until that point. And the way that you can check on this is to look at dinosaur books that were published before the year 1990. Usually they will, if they're going to have any kind of a dromaeosaur, they'll have Deinonychus. They will not have Velociraptor because Velociraptor was pretty obscure before that. Let's talk about that. And Mini Pie, I might require you to move here. Could I request that? Would you do that for me, Mini Pie? Um, this is a lovely, lovely book. There will never be another book like this ever published. This was a super comprehensive dinosaur book that was published in the early 1980s by... Uh, well, David Norman wrote the text. John Sibick did most of the illustrations for it. If not all of them. Most of them. And, uh, watch out, Minnie Pie. Here it comes. <laughs> You're hitting the soundboard, Minnie. Get this. This was, uh... This is really something when it first came out. Uh, a dinosaur book written by one of the leading dinosaur paleontologists at the time, chock full of information, basically a beautiful summary of much of the literature ever published on dinosaurs up until that point. There will never be another dinosaur book published like this that's this comprehensive, just because there's too much information nowadays, and the field moves too quickly. Back in the 1980s, there was, uh, you know, dinosaurs weren't really... Not as many people studied dinosaurs back then. There were maybe 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists on the planet at the time. And Teramu, thank you for that gift sub. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and the artwork of your childhood. There you go, Ken. <coughs> and good luck at the dentist. Holy moly, I need to schedule a dentist appointment before I leave for the field. Anyway. Before the film Jurassic Park came out, Dinosaur science was kind of a, a backwater. And that's kind of reflected in how comprehensive this book could be, because it just wasn't that much information back then. Dromaeosaurids are these sickle-clawed, meat-eating dinosaurs. And the big star was always Deinonychus. Deinonychus was a dinosaur that helped change the way that we think about dinosaurs. Deinonychus was a very popular dinosaur. If you're like, it was one of those tier two dinosaurs where it's, you know, you've got the, the top tier dinosaurs that everyone knows. You know, Tyrannosaurus, Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus, Triceratops. Deinonychus is like one tier down from them, where like if you knew a thing or two about dinosaurs, you definitely knew about Deinonychus. A little bit more obscure was Dromaeosaurus here, from Alberta, Canada. And then more obscure than that was Velociraptor. This was a dinosaur that 
It's from Mongolia. It's from the late Cretaceous period. It wasn't very well known to the general public. Not until Jurassic Park came out. Now, the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park are actually a dinosaur called Deinonychus, and I'll show you why. We'll be going over this several times today, but I figured I'd just cover it at the beginning for everybody who's here right now, and then later on as we get raided in and new people stumble and that kind of thing, we'll go over it again, I'm sure. But, uh, let me show you the book that is the reason why the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park are actually Deinonychus, or rather why the Deinonychus in Jurassic Park get called Velociraptor. That's from, uh, from this book over here. Greg Paul's Predatory Dinosaurs of the World. This was, uh, not the most popular book at the time, but Michael Crichton referenced this. He also probably spoke with Greg Paul as he was writing Jurassic Park. As he was working on this novel, this was super cutting-edge stuff, and he may have even gotten an early copy of the book. It was published. Predatory Dinosaurs of the World, a complete illustrated guide. This was, this was a big deal when it came out for the field of dinosaur paleontology. Originally published... 1988. And so as Michael Crichton was working on the novel Jurassic Park, this was cutting edge brand new stuff. And uh, here we go. Let's look up Velociraptor here in the index and I can show you the page. It kind of changed it all. Let's see. V, Velociraptor Enteropus. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Alright. So this is gonna require a little bit of explanation, but it's important. So this dinosaur right here, today we would call Deinonychus. Deinonychus is from Montana. It was dug up by John Ostrom. In fact, I'll show you a little clip right here. I believe it's right here. Yeah. We watched this a couple days ago, but that's okay. I really enjoy it. Um, I hope you do too. And it's cool to see the guy who made this discovery talk about it, you know? This is straight from the source. Our era, the end of the Mesozoic, it's called the Age of Reptiles. What you doing? Not Charles Knight, Gravity. Here's These are the Rudolph Salinger. Here's the picture Salinger. of dinosaurs. Yeah. Pea-brained giants lumbering through lush tropical foliage. Old-fashioned stuff. Gorging themselves on leaves and grass. For years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. Since the 40s, when it was painted, a number of discoveries have been made, and new ideas have been thrown into the debate. Yep. And perhaps one of the most important discoveries <laughs> was made by me. Yeah. I love how proud he is there. That gets me every time. Yeah, I'm going I'm to clean up my face. It was 1964. John Ostrom recalls that he had been digging for months in Low County, Montana, and not finding very much. Time had run out. His crew had packed up their equipment and were heading for their cars. You know, we've been looking for five years before we found anything as exciting as this. Close to where the cars were parked, Ostrom noticed something in the rock. Since his tools were already stowed away, he began to scrape the dirt with his fingernails. This is what he saw first. Startling. I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Notice the extraordinarily large claws 
sharp, curved, clearly the hands of a predaceous animal. Um, associated, found very close to this, uh, was this object, obviously a claw, which I thought belonged to the hand because it looks very much like the claws on those fingers. But there was no place for it to fit. And I puzzled over that for some time. But we found the answer. And yes, indeed, hard treads. Turns out that that uh, grasses evolved basically after the dinosaurs went extinct, except for a handful of birds. Um, that's after the end of the age of dinosaurs that grasses really first evolved. Really, spared no expense. And Teramu. Did a tier one sub to call me go. Thank you, thank you for. I really appreciate that, Teramu. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Such a soft-spoken fellow. I mean, John Ostrom helped change the way that people thought about dinosaurs. Like. He had a tremendous influence on on the the direction of dinosaur science. Um, without John Ostrom, there would be no Jurassic Park. I can tell you that. <sighs> yeah. Claw didn't belong to the hand at all. In fact, it belonged to the foot. Hmm. But then something more came to light in our quarry, and uh, I'll show you just a part of it. Bits and pieces of the tail hmm. encased in bundles of ossified tendons all along each right side, left side, underneath. This made the tail completely stiff. like a. So ossified tendons are when, you know, tendon actually turns to bone as the animal develops and matures. And so that obviously, you know, tendons can be flexible. When they turn to bone, they get really rigid. They get hard. They... They get stiff like this, so this was a, a beautiful kind of stiffening agent for the tail to make the tail basically like a, you know, he's going to say like a balancing rod. What I picture is a balancing pole. It kept the animal, helped the animal keep its balance yep. while it was using those sickles on its feet for killing whatever it was hungry for. Yeah. <laughs> Ostrom named the animal Deinonychus, terrible claw, yeah. a killing machine that came into being more than a hundred million years ago and used both hands and feet to snatch and rend its prey, keeping yep. its balance by the remarkable adaptation in its tail. Nothing like the galumphing brutes in the Yale Muro, but a speedy acrobat, a racer. Yep. Active, fast moving, probably warm blooded, social, intelligent, very bird like creature. Before Jurassic Park came out, Deinonychus was the dinosaur that was kind of the poster child for, for all the stuff I mentioned fast moving, active, social, intelligent. That was Deinonychus. And there's even a song about it from We Sing Dinosaurs. Some of you are already familiar with this. Deinonychus lived in the early Cretaceous period. I'll pull up some after images. After Allosaurus and before Tyrannosaurus Rex. One of the most fearsome hunters wasn't big at all. There's that he classic image. Close to ten feet long and only five feet tall. Deinonychus. Yeah. With his powerful jaw, John Ostrom, Dinonychus, <laughs> with his terrible claw. Yeah. So anyway, Dinonychus was the. Stalking quickly through the woods, he hunted with a pack. When they spied a likely foe, they'd race to the attack. Dinonychus, with his powerful jaw. Deinonychus. You'll see illustrations of Deinonychus in all kinds of claw. older dinosaur books like this. Going way, way, way back. His arms were long to hold his prey. Sharp claws were used to grip. Yeah. But the deadly claw was on his foot, the one he used to rip. Deinonychus. With his powerful jaw. Deinonychus. Yeah. With his terrible claw. Hey, you get the idea. What are dinosaurs? 
Anywho, and uh, Suki Yo Mitha Saberwolf, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you. Yeah. And Cosmic Seekin, oh, this, uh, the older book, the David Norman book, is the illustrated encyclopedia of dinosaurs. Yeah. Um,. This was, it, it's now very out of date in a lot of ways. But at the time, this was cutting edge, comprehensive. If you wanted to know everything there was to know about dinosaurs back in the 1980s, this was the book that you wanted. Uh, unparalleled, unprecedented, excellent. There will never be another book like this ever written that's this comprehensive. Because there's just too much nowadays. There's too much to know. The, the science moves too quickly to be able to comp to, to organize such a comprehensive book, too. So this is like a beautiful time capsule of, uh... Yeah, yeah. Oh, here's a... I got another copy of here. This is the one that you'll probably find more often. The other one is combined with pterosaurs, too. But this is, uh... It's just the dinosaurs one, yeah. Yeah. Today we have Wikipedia. Exactly, Charlie's Dragon, yeah. Anywho, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anywho, all of that, the, uh, the Deinonychus song, you know. Deinonychus lived. Yep. With his terrible claws. The whole point of me making a big deal about Deinonychus is to make sense of this. I'm digging soon. Hang on a on his foot, the one he used to rip. What is this? A Ko-Fi donation? With his powerful jaw, Deinonychus, with his terrible claw. Good stuff. With his powerful jaw. Thank you kindly. Dynonicus. Digging soon. With his terrible. And we'll use those funds wisely. And only for good. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Um Yeah. Yeah. The reason I bring up Deinonychus is to make sense of this, to make sense of why the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park are actually Deinonychus. When they're, when there's the, like we saw at the beginning of today's stream, you know, Snake Water, Montana, digging up Velociraptor. A Velociraptor is not from Montana. A Velociraptor is from Mongolia, from, from Eastern Asia. Deinonychus is from Montana. And when you look at that scene... That's very clearly Deinonychus there. The skull is that of Deinonychus. Deinonychus right here. We have Deinonychus, and we have Velociraptor. Deinonychus is a good deal larger. Velociraptor is significantly smaller. It's about two meters long, about two and a half feet tall. Uh, yeah, not not as big as Deinonychus is. Yeah. Uh, little small guy. Yeah, silly little man. Exactly. So why do they call it... Why do they call it Velociraptor in Jurassic Park if it's actually Deinonychus? Well, it's because of this book. So, Greg Paul, who wrote this book, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World, wrote and illustrated it. Uh, yeah, there's Velociraptor right there. Um, Greg Paul likes to do some stuff where he'll he'll look at different dinosaur groups and he'll say, well, these ones are pretty similar. I'm just going to move them into the same name. So that's what he did with Deinonychus Enteropus. He said, it's pretty similar to Velociraptor, so we're just going to we're gonna say it doesn't deserve its own genus. We'll keep the species name Enteropus. We'll just make it Velociraptor Enteropus. Instead of Deinonychus Antaropus. And this is the name in the novel Jurassic Park. Velociraptor Antaropus. 
So when Michael Crichton was writing the novel Jurassic Park, this is what he was going with. And he was getting some really up-to-date information about dinosaurs, but there was just a little bit of, you might say, taxonomic activism that Greg Paul was doing there. And, uh... It's, it's, I think he also, Michael Crichton also really liked the, the sound of the name of a Velociraptor, uh, which makes sense. It's a wonderful name. Deinonychus is a wonderful name too, the Terrible Claw, but it doesn't quite have the same ring as Velociraptor. Velociraptor is, it's such an evocative name. It's... There's speed and power and attitude in that name. Velociraptor. It sounds fearsome. It sounds formidable. It's That's a critter to watch out for. Deinonychus. It almost sounds more like a Greek philosopher's name or something. Doesn't quite have the same punch to it. So it makes sense. But this book is why. And it's funny, Greg Paul didn't continue with this in other books. So he's written other books since then, like the Princeton Field Guide to Dinosaurs, written and illustrated by Greg Paul. He does not sink Velociraptor into Deinonychus in that book, which came out in like 2010 or something. So it was like, it was kind of a uh, slightly off the wall, very temporary idea, but it happened at just the right time to make it into the novel Jurassic Park and hence be immortalized in the films afterward. That's why the Velociraptors from Jurassic Park are actually Deinonychus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Dionysus, lesser known cousin. There you go, Sloppy Salamander. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, I saw a, a video on YouTube a little while ago purporting to clear this up, the whole Velociraptor, Deinonychus, Utah Raptor thing by uh, Clint's Reptile. So we're going to take a look at that and we'll see if he if he comes to the correct conclusion. There. It's funny, I was going to make a YouTube video about this years ago, back before I ever discovered Twitch, back before I got started here. I was trying to make it big on YouTube and that didn't go anywhere. Um... But yeah, Clint's Reptiles has managed to, uh, to gain a decent viewership. Let's hope he's got his information right. We're going to take a look. There we go. And for everybody just joining us, happy Velociraptor Awareness Day today. I hope you're having a good one. There we go. Yeah. It's entitled, Which Raptor is Actually in Jurassic Park? Hint, it's not Velociraptor. Oh boy, he better not say it's Utah Raptor. Because it's definitely not Utah Raptor in, like, you know, the true sense of the word. Let, let's just, let's see what he says. Well, hi there. And he's got the same uh, Deinonychus skull that I do. Except his might be printed a little bit smaller. Mine's printed life-size right there. Uh, that's a good sign. That suggests that he might know the real deal about this. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Dinosaurs are probably the coolest things that have ever lived on this planet. Agreed. You know, other than Arthur Fonzarelli. As no, a kid, my fonts. biggest passion were dinosaurs. The movie Jurassic Park was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And that movie taught me about a kind of dinosaur that I had never heard of before, though it was in some of my dinosaur books. Yeah, and this emphasizes that point that before Jurassic Park, Velociraptor was an obscure dinosaur, at least as the general public is concerned. Almost nobody outside of paleontological circles had ever heard of Velociraptor. It was an obscure dinosaur. Yeah. A dinosaur that became one of my absolute favorites, Velociraptor. Yeah. Which I only later found out was not in the movie at all. Yep. 
Yeah, this is what Velociraptor actually looked like, or something close to this. We know it had feathers all over its body. We'll talk about that in a bit, too. To my knowledge, there haven't been any Velociraptors in any of the Jurassic Park or Jurassic World movies. I'll talk more about True. that later. Yeah. But the truth is that Velociraptor and the dinosaur that they called Velociraptor in the Jurassic Park movies both belong to a group of dinosaurs called the Maniraptoran dinosaurs. Yep, birds are part of this group as well. Maniraptora is kind of a big clade. There's a bunch of different families within it. Maniraptora also includes the Therizinosaurs. It includes the uh, the Ovaraptorosaurs, the Troodontids, the Scansoriopterids. There, there's a number of different groups within Maniraptora, um, not just the Dromaeosaurs. It's family Dromaeosauridae, though. We'll probably get to that. And today. I want to introduce you to this group because it's a really cool group of dinosaurs and the yeah. only group of Birds dinosaurs in general, that Yelkes. didn't go extinct at the end Birds of the Cretaceous. Unless you're talking about clades that include the Maniraptorans or that are within the Maniraptoran clade. The yeah. fact is that there are some Maniraptoran dinosaurs alive today. But before we get yeah, there, the birds. I want to spend just a moment talking about... Not just some, there are... I'm sorry, how many different species of Maniraptor and dinosaur alive today? Over 9,000! Uh, yeah, it, like every living species of bird. There's like 10,000 living species of birds. What dinosaurs are, because many people think that all ancient reptiles were dinosaurs. It's just that this is not the case. There oh, were right. many ancient lineages of reptiles. So this is, this is kind of a basic level video. I'm really glad that he's doing this. Um, yeah. Reptiles, in fact, all of the major lineages of reptiles alive today were present alongside the dinosaurs, as well as many more. Turtles, crocodilians, lizards, and rhynchocephalians all date back to the time of the dinosaurs. Bingo. Other groups I'm so glad he mentioned rhynchocephalians. Some love for the tuataras. Ah, oh, Glad to see it's it. Like plesiosaurs, pterosaurs, and ichthyosaurs did as well, though they're all extinct now. And yeah. there were even reptiles that predated the dinosaurs. Not to mention that there is a single dinosaur lineage that is alive still. And again, they happen to be many raptor and dinosaurs. So yep. yeah. what is a dinosaur? Dinosaurs are a distinct lineage of reptiles as unique from the others as are crocodilians, turtles, lizards, or rhynchocephalians. They're or more closely related to the crocodilians than the crocodilians are to any other group of extant reptiles. And the True. two of them, the crocodilians and the dinosaurs, comprise part of the archosaurian clade of diapsid reptiles. The dinosaur clade includes animals like stegosaurs, ankylosaurs, ceratopsians, pachycephalosaurs, ornithopods, sauropods, and theropods, though... Yeah, Herrerasaurus that he's, he pointed to right there might not actually be a theropod. In fact, we're not 100% sure that that's even a dinosaur. Um... sauropods and theropods. Yeah, so there are some researchers that think that Herrerasaurus might actually be just outside of Dinosauria entirely. It might be a very, very dinosaur-like non-dinosaur. It may have split off before the origin of the dinosaurs. We're not 100% sure yet. We're still kind of working on that. So it might not be a theropod. It might not be a dinosaur at all. It might be just outside of Dinosauria. Though the exact relationships between these groups is currently somewhat under debate. And yeah. the dinosaur clade would include... And Axeman says, why are there over 9,000 species of bird, but we have only identified a relative handful of Cretaceous Maniraptoran species? I mean, we've probably got a couple hundred Cretaceous Maniraptorans at this point. So, you know, it'd be a big handful. But that's just because, A, we don't have a whole lot of paleontologists working on this and they don't have a lot of funding and the fossil record itself uh can be much more incomplete than if you just like go outside and walk around and look for critters today you know does that make sense yeah it is easier to look at burbs yes kuchira as we will be discussing later for thursday birds day um but yeah yeah so that's a big part of it also at the end of the Cretaceous period, when you've got that big extinction event, it created like a an ecological vacuum. Suddenly there were all of these niches open, and so birds, only a few species of birds survived, but they were able to diversify in a crazy way. They went nuts afterward. 
that's one of the reasons why there are so many species of bird around today. Uh, they didn't have competition from things like pterosaurs anymore. These pterosaurs got wiped out. So that's a big part of it. Yeah. And Charlie's Dragon, absolutely, yeah. Fossilization is a relatively rare event. And you might have situations where not a single individual of an entire species might ever become a fossil just because they lived in the wrong environment. They don't live in a spot where they would get fossilized. They'd get preserved. You know, if you're living up in the mountains in an erosional environment, it could be that your whole species, you know, diverges and thrives and then goes extinct over the course of millions of years. Maybe not even one individual gets buried and fossilized during that time. If you happen to live in a non-depositional environment. Appalachian Hatcher source. There you go, Salamander. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. So, good question, Axe Man. Good question. Yeah. Well, let's continue. These groups, their most recent. Oh, and we do see similar speciation boom after prior. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's why mammals diversify too after the end of the Cretaceous. Um, yeah. Mammals go crazy after that. Uh, dinosaurs also, you know, really diversify significantly at the beginning of the Jurassic period, after the Triassic Jurassic extinction event. At the beginning of the Jurassic, dinosaurs go nuts and diversify into all these different clades. Uh, that happens a lot after a big extinction event. Certain groups just, they, uh, you know, we, we really need a, a soundboard, uh, for, uh, Yeah. Here we go. It's free real estate. Yeah. It's free real estate <laughs> after an extinction event. Whoever can, can rise to exploit that will do really well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyhow. Uh, <laughs> very funny ball machine. Here, let's uh, let's continue. Some common ancestors and everything in between. They can most easily be identified. Oh, I know this Tyrannosaurus specimen. Does anybody know who this is? Anybody recognize this Tyrannosaurus specimen here? Boy, it's not Stan, nope. No, not quite Neverwinter. It's not Sue. It's not Carnotaurus or a Carnosaur. Not Sue. Uh... Well, if you said either the Wonkle Rex. Or MOR555, or the nation's T Rex, or Big Mike, then holy cow, you are very much correct. Yes. So this is a bronze cast of the Wonkle Rex, specimen MOR555, uh, which was later rechristened the nation's T Rex. But this one is standing out front of Museum of the Rockies. Uh, this specimen, this specimen, and I go way back. We really do. Uh, this particular mount, even. Um, yeah, out front of Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. So this is a bronze cast of that Tyrannosaurus specimen. Uh, the original used to be on display in the museum. And then we basically gifted it to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And it was, a, it was a big thing. Big deal. But anyway, this is out there year-round outside Museum of the Rockies. It's all covered with snow during the winter. And many, many late nights, sometimes when I couldn't sleep, I'd go walk to the museum and uh, just go sit underneath 
this T-Rex skeleton. I'd, I'd go lean up there, put my back up against the metatarsals on the, uh, the right hind leg. And, uh, just look up through the rib cage at the stars. Yeah. We spent a lot of quality time together. Me and this... This particular skeletal mount. This bronze cast of the Wonkel Rex. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Big Mike... So it was named after, I think, the university chancellor at the time or something. His name was Michael something or other. Uh, I think he helped secure the funding to make this bronze cast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anywho. It's the same one right there. By their pelvic morphology, including having their hind limbs directly under their body, as well as a host of other more subtle skeletal attributes. Ancestral yep. dinosaurs were bipedal, walking on two limbs, but many lineages have quadrupedal a lot of these images members, from Wikipedia. most you still having longer hind limbs than forelimbs. The Manny Raptoran dinosaurs are well understood to be members of the theropod clade. Mm -hmm. This clade includes lots of the coolest dinosaurs, such All as the Carnotaurus, Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Spinosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus rex. Though the closest relatives to the Maniraptorans were the Ornithomimosaurs, such as Gallimimus yep. and Struthiomimus. One big difference between the Maniraptoran dinosaurs and most... There's actually some trees that put uh, Ornithomimosaurs within Maniraptorid, Maniraptoridae, Maniraptora. But they're, uh, that's not like a common result that people get. I've seen a few phylogenies like that, but it's, it doesn't happen. Most other theropods is that the Manny Raptorans have very large and dexterous forelimbs. In fact, yep. the There's name Manny Raptora means hand thief or hand plunderer. Those yep. hands, like those of most theropods, possessed three fingers. Those. So that's an oh, that's an ornith. No, who is that? Is that Ostroraptor? Some are lost to fusion like the in some lineages. They also raptor. have a large bony sternum, as well as the half moon shaped bones in the wrists. The Dr. Grant was so kind to point out to us. Yeah, those are semi lunate carpal bones. Um, talk all about this sort of thing in a uh, little diagram I put together. A few Thanksgivings ago. Uh, your turkey is a dinosaur. We have this hanging up in the office today. But you can download that, print it, and this goes into detail about all of these different features. Not all of these. A number of different features. This is only a small handful. Um, the cool things that make birds unique among animals today that were not unique during, say, the Cretaceous period. Because each of these cool, unique bird features, from their hollow bones to the S-shaped curve to their neck, the semi-lunate carpal bone in their wrist that allows them to swivel it, their hinge-like ankle joints, even their wishbone, or their feathers. Every single one of these things, dinosaurs evolved first, and birds just inherited those. It really was like the perfect recipe for the evolution of flight because all of these different bits of anatomy that birds would need for flight, they just got as hand-me-downs from their dinosaur ancestors. You know, birds were like uh, the original Nepo babies. <laughs> they, uh, they got everything they needed. Uh from their ancestors, you know? So oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's why birds are dinosaurs, just because they evolved from dinosaurs. And almost everything that makes birds super cool today, those are actually dinosaur features that they just inherited, you know? Birds are not self-made in that regard. <laughs> uh, it kind of makes you appreciate bats a little bit more, maybe, uh, but yeah. Um, Jody Fish says, birds got all the parts and then figured out how to put them together to synergize. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. And there you go, Alexander Morrison. Yeah. Yeah. So I made this diagram that you could print out and bring to Thanksgiving or whatever other sumptuous pagan ritual 
you meat-eating people engage with. <laughs> if you're ever dissecting a bird carcass, whether it's a turkey for Thanksgiving or a, a suckling goose for Christmas or a, a, a budgie for Boxing Day, for whatever birds people eat, I don't know, that's weird. No judgment, though. Print this out. Show your friends and family and whoever else shows up. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Uh, Cornish hen for coronation day. Is that how that works, Jody Fish? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you at any point you can type an exclamation mark turkey in order to uh, to pull that up. The pubic bone turned backward. And the vertebrae full of air sacs and hollows. Common to the coelosaurians, a large clade that includes yeah. the many raptorans. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. Actually, it means plunderer, but you got the rest right, Dr. Gray. I mean, that's the thing, is that the word raptor used in common parlance did just mean bird of prey up until Jurassic Park came out. Like, people forget that. That movie changed our culture to the point where the word raptor became synonymous with dromaeosaur dinosaurs. Didn't used to mean that. It didn't. In 1993, when this came out, you know, real it did mean bird of prey. With six I get the daggers for teeth, he was the terror of his neighborhood. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Button Mantra says, so would Velociraptor have tasted like turkey? I don't know. They might be more likely to eat you, Button Mantra. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the right person to ask. I don't, I don't really eat a lot of meat. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyhow. And like many other theropods, most, if not all members of this clade possessed feathers. But yep. let's dig into Bingo. this rad group of dinosaurs and figure out what exactly is in- Has he got a, an ornitho- No, that's a, that's a 3D printed velociraptor skull there. Cool. It's a little big. In Jurassic Park, since it isn't a velociraptor, a swift plunderer. I'd like to take a moment just to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon that allow us to do awesome videos like this. Honestly, these videos take so much time for me yeah. to research and for us to produce. We don't even know if people will be interested in watching them, but because of your support, we can afford to do some experiments like this. So That's thank like you. Me here. If you want to see us continue to make the content we are most excited to thank make, you. please consider supporting us on Patreon. The first group of many raptoran dinosaurs that we are going to talk about are a group that I only learned existed a few years ago. These might be some of the craziest Let's looking... Let's protect our fossils, because if they're removed, Reesey. America loses them forever. Thank you, thank you, Reese. For subscribing right there. Holy moly, do I appreciate that. Welcome to the community. Um, thanks for using that prime. Thanks for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. You won't have to worry about any ads now for the next month. And for as long as you remember to renew those those Prime subs, you're on easy street there. Thank you. Yeah. Let's continue. ...of all dinosaurs. In fact, if you know a crazier one, I want to hear about it because... Is he going to talk about Therizinosaurs or is he going to talk about Alvarosaurs? These are crazy, and they happen to be Michelle's favorite dinosaurs. Therizinosaurus. These right? are members of the clade Therizinosauria. Yep. Therizinosaurus, the genus for which the clade is named, means reaper or sickle lizard. Kind yep. of a crazy Scythe name. Lizard. Right up until you see the claws they have on their front limbs. Nuts. Though these appear to be intimidating Absurd weapons claws. of death, as are sickles generally. Their function was likely more related to stripping leaves from trees, like those of ground sloths. There is not really stripping leaves from. They would just kind of use them as like a big rake to kind of pull the the tree branches down closer to the mouth. Um, it's not like they're using the claws to slice up a tree or anything. It doesn't seem like that. That would really make sense. Dinosaurs appeared to have been herbivores. Yep. Members of this clade ranged in size from about seven feet to over thirty feet just over two to about 10 meters. 
and have been found in the Cretaceous deposits in North America and Asia. Yep. The next group cool. is a bit difficult to place within the Maniraptora. These Not are the Alvarez Soria. It yeah! Like, these are some of my very favorite dinosaurs. Critters like Triraracuncus and Mononychus. It's clear that they're Maniraptoran dinosaurs, but where did they go? Some yeah. phylogenies depict them as sharing a more recent common ancestor with the other many Raptoran dinosaurs than the Therizinosaurs, some a more recent ancestor. In the past, they were thought to be very closely related to the only living clade of dinosaurs, the Avialans, birds. because they yeah. have a keeled sternum and fused hand and wrist bones, like birds. But as we've found Love more guys. members of the group, it appears that these similarities were derived independently, so placing them has been tricky. But generally, these are fairly small, just over a foot to uh, you know, maybe a little over six feet, or about half a meter to about two meters in total length. They've been found mostly in Asia and South America, but also in North America and Europe, and appear to have existed from the late Jurassic until the end of the Cretaceous. As we mentioned earlier, they have a lot of fusion in their wrist and hand. This usually took the form of one big finger and two tiny little fingers. However, unlike birds, it looks like they use these huge fingers and strong bony reinforcement to dig and not to fly. Looking at their long jaws and small teeth, it's pretty likely that they were digging for insects on which they fed, possibly in termite mounds. The next group is almost certainly more closely related to the other Maniraptoran so dinosaurs Ethan. than either the Alvarez Soridia or the Therizinosauria, and those are the Oviraptorosauria. Yeah, so he's just kind of going through all of these different clades of, of Maniraptoran dinosaurs here, which is neat. Um, but we've, I don't know, we came here to talk about Velociraptor today, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Past the Scansoriopterygids. Flying and, squirrels. Uh, and these are the first members of this group to be found uh, with adaptations for an arboreal... And Gravity, he really did do his research well. I'm impressed with this. Um, he is, I think, an evolutionary biologist or a herpetologist. I'm not sure exactly what his background is, but he's the real deal. So uh, salute to Clint here for, uh, for you know, proffering some good information. It was excellent stuff. Well, and... And finder keeper, yeah, over Raptorosaurs, we no longer think we're egg plunderers. That's, uh, yeah, and there's a funny story about that. I'll tell you sometime if, uh, if you want to hear it. Somewhat flighted lifestyle. And that remains, yeah. gets us yeah. to the U Manny Raptora, the true hand plunderers. And my. Yeah, and so sometimes we call these Deinonychosaurs. Um. Rap. U Manny Raptora. Yeah, so. It some of these letters got mixed up here. Um, anyway, the Eumanoraptorans are the troodontids of the dromaeosaurs and the birds. Sometimes these two clades get placed into another clade called Deinonychosauria, named after Deinonychus. And then birds are outside of that. But that's the thing. Like, this is what we would call a polytomy in cladistics here. So, like, we don't really know who's closer to who. It could be that that birds are closer to troodontids, and either one is to the dromaeosaurs. Could be that these two are actually closer. It could be that birds evolved first, and then these guys and these guys evolved from birds, which would mean that troodontids and dromaeosaurs, the velociraptor, would be birds. But we don't we don't know that. Um, so far, the origins of all these groups are a little hazy. They probably diverged in, like, the middle Jurassic or something like that, and we just don't have the fossils yet to be able to figure out what the ancestor of these clades looked like. That is still a mystery, and someday somebody is going to figure that out. Maybe that is someone watching this broadcast right now. Maybe one of you will figure this out someday. Because somebody is going to. So, no. Let that inspire you, I suppose. I just realized we didn't have our closed captions on. Shoot. There we go. Closed captions. Testing. Testing. Are you working closed captions? Closed captions say, yes, I'm working. I'm working. Closed captions, I'm working. Okay, good. Yeah. Anyhow. 
Uh, let's continue. And my personal favorite group of mini Raptorans, truly. This group includes the Dromaeosaurids, the Troodontids, yeah. and the Avialans. There is some disagreement about which of these groups is most closely related to the Troodontids, the Dromaeosaurids, or the Avialans. So I will just talk about the Dromaeosaurids first and the Troodontids in the middle, so they will be next to their closest relatives, whoever those turn out to be. The Dromaeosaurids are the group we are the most excited to discuss anyway, because Velociraptor and the bigger, badder Manny Raptorn from Jurassic Park are both in this group. You see, Velociraptor, which comes from Mongolia and Inner Mongolia at the end of the Cretaceous, was a formidable... I don't know if it's actually been found in Inner Mongolia. Inner Mongolia is a region in China. Um, a, I don't know if it's a, a district. I think it's just kind of a, a loose region in China. But um, I don't know if Velociraptor has ever been found there. I don't know if they have exposures of exposures of the the de Jacta formation there, which is where Velociraptor is from. I don't think Velociraptor per se has been found in the Namekta formation. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Creature. This is its skull. That's a sculpt of a Velociraptor skull there. Um. So this is from Inhuman Species on uh, on various like three D print uh, sites where you can get the files for three D prints. There's a few things I would tweak about this. Um, for one, it's a little too big. But yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah. An actual Velociraptor skull, well, a cast of one I have right here on my office wall today. Uh, this is a reconstruction of a Velociraptor skull. It's been sculpted. Um, it's not bad. It's definitely not bad. It's good, but it's... Yeah. Yeah. And Roland Ratas, how are you doing? Uh... And Mongolia is a country, but then again, Scotland is a country, but a country which is part of Great Britain and the United Kingdom. So, Roland Rata, Mongolia is a totally different country from China. In fact, there's, you know, it... Mongolia is a country in a way that Scotland is not quite a country. Like, Scotland doesn't have an embassy. Scotland doesn't have, like, an Olympic team. Uh, they do have their own flag, obviously, but I know they're part of the United Kingdom, but we the UK is, like, a country like that, in the same way that Mongolia is. So Mongolia is, is nestled between Russia and China. And it is very much its own country. Yeah. Uh, different language than in China or Russia. Um, very different culture. It's just, uh, it, it's very, very different. Yeah. In Scotland, people still speak English, you know? And they're protected by the, you know, the military forces of the UK. Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy, etc., etc. Mongolia is a country that's very much at odds with Russia and China. They've been at war with both of those countries before. They're uh, they're very, very much a different country, you know. So yeah, yeah. Um, anyhow, yeah. Uh, but yeah. W whereas Inner Mongolia is a region in China. Uh, in northern China, and I think it's kind of loosely defined. Uh, I don't think spe people speak Mongolian in Inner Mongolia. I think they speak Chinese. Uh, but I'm not totally sure. Yeah. Um. Any. Yeah. Uh, Ulaanbaatar. Yes, indeed, activated complex. Uh, the only city in the entire... And the entire country of Mongolia is Ulaanbaatar. Basically, everything else is just a backwater or like a little village or something. 
Ulaanbaatar is a world-class city, and it's like the only city in the entire country. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anywho, yeah. And Doggerland, so Doggerland was between uh, Great Britain and mainland Europe, right? Hard treads, there would have been dinosaurs there during certain times of, of Earth history, sure. Yeah. Um, when sea levels were lower. Thank you for the hydrates there. Yeah. Um, very buddy button mantra. Okay. Scottish English is more similar to England's English than Mongolian is to Chinese. You know? So yeah. Completely different languages. Different written languages. Different spoken languages. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh... Here, let's... Since we're talking about Velociraptor, let's talk about Mongolia a little bit. Um... Yeah. Here, let's... See... We can find a short ish video about Mongolia. Um, oh, goodness. Let's just look at this. We'll start the first bit of this real life lore video. Up. Mongolia is perhaps the most fascinating country in the modern world. First of all, it's huge. It's more than twice the size of Texas, and if you placed it over the United States, it would basically cover the it's entire big. historical south of the country, spanning from Philadelphia in the east to Dallas in the west. But trapped in the middle of the Eurasian continent, Mongolia is surrounded on all of its sides by hundreds of kilometers of land separating it from the ocean, making yep. it the largest landlocked country in the world that doesn't have access to an internal sea. In theory, Kazakhstan is substantially larger than Mongolia and technically also classified as landlocked, but Kazakhstan also in enjoys a nearly 1900 kilometer long coastline with the internal Caspian Sea, across yep. which it can conduct maritime trade with Russia, Azerbaijan, okay. Iran, and yeah. Turkmenistan. Mongolia. Mongolia, on the other hand, possesses no such direct access to any large bodies of water. And partially because of that and a whole bunch of other factors, Mongolia is quite literally the emptiest country on the planet. You see, so, Mongolia has more than one and a half million square kilometers. Mongolia reminds me a lot of Wyoming in the US. They share a lot of similarities. They've got almost the same climate. They both have a wealth of dinosaur fossils. There are some kind of amusing cultural similarities between Wyoming and Mongolia, and they're both extremely sparsely populated. Almost nobody lives in, in both countries, honestly. Um, not almost nobody, but they are very, very sparsely populated. Yeah. kilometers worth of land, which makes that the 18th largest country in the world in terms of overall area. But Mongolia also has a pretty tiny population of just around 3.3 million people. And like, I think more than half of those people live in the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. People who live across all of that land, which is basically yeah. just the same amount of people as live around San Diego in California. <laughs> because of this, Mongolia's yep. average population density is just at around 2.1 people per square kilometer of land which is yep. by far the absolute lowest of any sovereign country in the world. For reference, Nuts. that density of people across Mongolia is roughly a third lower than the countries who have the second and third lowest population densities in the world. Australia yep. and Namibia, both of which have large amounts of their territories covered with vast, uninhabitable deserts. But Mongolia is somehow even emptier than all of this at first suggests. <laughs> Australia has multiple large population centers with five cities scattered around the country that have more than one million residents apiece. Mm -hmm. Meaning that the distribution of people around Australia is far more evenly- Even emptier than- Mon absolutely even emptier than Montana Neverwinter, which- who, who thought that was possible? ...distributed than it is in <laughs> Mongolia. Because despite how it appears, Mongolia is basically just one giant city-state with a ton of empty land around it that yep. is cosplaying as the world's 18th biggest country. The capital and the largest city in Mongolia is here, Ulaanbaatar, and it's home to yeah. about 1.6 million people, which makes it actually a really big city. Ulaanbaatar yeah. is the core of the modern Mongolian state, and its population places so, it on... There are... There's like twice as many people who live in Ulaanbaatar than live in San Francisco, for instance. Um, 
it's I think it might be a similar population or maybe a higher population than Los Angeles. But it's basically the only city in the entire country. On a par with Barcelona and Spain for a similar number of people. But the fact that this big of a city exists within Mongolia means that Ulaanbaatar alone is home to roughly 48% of the entire Mongolian <laughs> population. This makes Mongolia one of the most highly Nuts. centralized countries yeah. in the entire world. And because Ulaanbaatar only takes up 0.3% of Mongolia's land, it means that you've got a situation in the country where 48% of the population, or 1.6 million people, all live on just 0.3% of the land. That's nuts. While the other 52% yeah. of the population, or 1.7 million people, all live across the remaining 99.7% of the land. <laughs> this means that Ulaanbaatar's massively concentrated population greatly skews the average population density across the whole country. Country. And so, when you exclude the city's land from the calculation, the remaining 99.7% of Mongolia contains an average population density of just 1.1 people per square kilometer, Crazy. which is it's about nuts. three it's times so emptier than Australia so and Namibia both are on average. To put that figure into further perspective, 99.7% of Mongolia's land is nearly half as densely populated with people as the far northern region of Finland called Lapland that stretches <laughs> well above the Arctic Circle and is the least Ah! populated part of the European yeah. Union. It is across this vast, empty stretch of Mongolia where roughly one-third of the population continues to this day in the 21st century to live a nomadic herding lifestyle that would, in many yep. ways, remain familiar to the era of Genghis Khan more than 800 years ago. So how did this situation in Mongolia develop and persist well into the 21st century? Uh, what is it about is this country climate. that has made it the, the weather, emptiest the... in the entire world? To begin the explanation, you need to understand some things about Mongolia's geography and climate. You see, the country's territory exists across most of the High Mongolian Plateau, a region of high elevation across Central Asia that is contained on all of its sides by even higher mountain step, ranges. There you go. The elevation across right, the Mongolian Plateau ranges from 1,000 to 1,500 meters above sea level, and Mongolia's borders within the High Plateau place it nearly 800 kilometers away from the nearest oceanic body of water, the Yellow Sea. So, yeah. because of the Mongolian Plateau's high elevation and distance away from the Indo-Pacific, deep within the Eurasian continental interior... Again, this reminds me of Wyoming so much. Yeah. Moist monsoon winds that bring rainfall from the Pacific rarely, if ever, are able to carry all of their moisture all the way into the Mongolian Plateau. So and it's dry. The north, the Mongolian Plateau also sits immediately beneath Siberia, which dramatically influences its climate and ability to contain people. Beginning around every August, the days in northern Asia steadily begin growing shorter and shorter as winter approaches, which causes the cold and dry air blowing into Siberia from the frozen Arctic Ocean to begin growing even colder. The air that then collects over Siberia then grows even colder than the air over the Arctic Ocean, because the air over the Arctic generally forms over sea ice that radiates heat better than the cold tundra environment of Siberia <laughs> does. Generally, from September to April, then every single year, I'm glad you're enjoying this collection this of Alters. very yeah. cold yeah. and dry Siberian air and high atmospheric pressure gets transferred across northern Eurasia, and particularly gets pushed into the Mongolian Plateau, which means that winters in Mongolia are nearly always very cold and very dry. The cold, oh, yeah. dry, and shallow air from Siberia plunges into the Mongolian Plateau's lower elevated river valleys and basins and then lingers there, generating brutally cold temperatures across the north of Mongolia that generally gets less severe the further south in the country you go. The median temperature across the country in January is negative 30 degrees Celsius. Oh, but that boy. fact obscures the reality that freak uh. cold snaps and blizzards can rapidly and unexpectedly happen pretty much anywhere in Mongolia during the long winter season. And temperatures can quickly shift on the order of 30 degrees Celsius in a matter of only 24 hours. Yeah, shoot. I think Montana is, is maybe the only place in the world that... Or maybe it was the only place in the U.S. I don't know. Montana also has extreme temper, temperature swings like this. Um, you know, where I used to live in Montana, where Deinonychus is from. Uh, yeah... Montana. Yep. From the Wikipedia article, United States temperature extremes, the largest recorded temperature change in one place over a 24-hour period occurred on January 15, 1972 in Loma, Montana, where temperatures rose from negative 54 degrees to 49 degrees Fahrenheit. 
That's nuts. That's nuts. In just 24 hours. Yeah. Crazy. From negative 47.8 to 9.4 degrees Celsius in just 24 hours. Insane. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And and gravity, of course. Yeah. Do with that what you will. That sounds awesome. Um, if you want to translate that to Spanish, I would be honored. Go for it. Yeah. But yeah. And activated complexes, there's also a phenomenon you have to watch out for when camping and presumably also when herding. There are valleys of death where cold air pools. They'll freeze you and your livestock solid overnight. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Nuts. So Montana and Wyoming just underneath it, just south of it, they've got similar climate to Mongolia. But Mongolia's temperatures might be even more extreme, honestly. Regional lows of down to negative 40 degrees Celsius are common across the north of the country during the winter. All of Mongolia's rivers and lakes will freeze over during the brutal winters because of this phenomenon. And many of the smaller rivers will freeze solid down to their bottom, which makes yeah. Mongolia's rivers and lakes not very useful for transportation or irrigation throughout <laughs> most of the year. Ulaanbaatar, the capital and the largest uh, city, is only free of frost for around three and a half months of the year between the middle of May and the Montana. end of August. Yeah. And the city's average annual temperature is just negative 2.9 degrees Celsius, or about 27 degrees Fahrenheit, which huh. makes Ulaanbaatar the coldest capital city on the planet. Really? That fact hides I didn't know the that. reality that during the short Mongol summers, temperatures can also soar into unbelievable highs of up to 38 degrees Celsius or 100 Fahrenheit in the southernmost region of the country and even yep. 33 degrees celsius or 91 fahrenheit in the capital so in the southern regions of of mongolia in the gobi desert that's where velociraptor has been found then yeah. accompanying these temperature extremes during very long cold winters and very short and happy velociraptor awareness day to you too dyson dinosaur it's good to see you here i uh i hope you're having a good one we're talking about mongolia uh right now where Velociraptor is from. Short hot summers is the further fact that Mongolia receives very, very little rainfall. The highly elevated Mongolian plateau is surrounded by even higher mountains that block most rainfall from entering into it from nearly every direction. To the south, the towering Himalayas and the Kunlun Shan mountains block rain coming in from that direction. To the west, the Altai mountains do the same. Yep. In addition to the Mongol Altai and Gobi Altai sub ranges further to the south. Moisture-rich winds blowing in from these directions pass over those mountains first and mostly deposit their moisture as snowfall on the sides of those mountains facing away from Mongolia. Then the winds are mostly dry by the time they blow over yeah, the Yeah, me Mongolia too, Dyson Dinosaur. And throughout the whole winter Mongolia between sometime. September and April, the dry yeah. and cold and high pressure air that blows into and then sits over the Mongolian plateau from Siberia forces away any low pressure, moist, and potentially rainy air. Which I would imagine this would be kind of like in... Uh... Maybe like the Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake Valley in, in Utah, where it's just like it's this nasty spot where you get all of this air pollution that just accumulates. I imagine they get a lot of really bad air in Ulaanbaatar and probably through other, throughout other parts of the country, too. Keeps the skies clear and cloud-free throughout the whole season. This is yeah. why Mongolia is actually one of the sunniest countries in the world. It averages huh. around 257 very sunny and cloud-free days a year, lending the country its nickname as the land of the eternal blue sky. But it also means that throughout the long winter between September and April, it hardly rains anywhere in Mongolia at all, and whatever mm. precipitation they do get is usually just snow or frost that blows down with the winds from Siberia. Ooh. Then, during the summer between May and August, Imagine when the high-pressure, no cold, and dry system from Siberia that weakens California, and retreats, you know? some amount of rainy air is finally able to penetrate into the Mongolian plateau from the north. This is why rainfall levels in northern Mongolia are, on average, much higher than in southern Mongolia. But it's important to understand that nearly all of northern Mongolia's rainfall just comes over a few months when the Siberian high-pressure system is at its weakest, between June and August. Outside of the summer months, northern Mongolia receives hardly any rain at all and is basically just as arid as the rest of the country. And then, even during the summer months, rainfall Beautiful is often unpredictable and now. difficult to count on. This effect yeah. has also contributed to the existence of the vast Gobi Desert.
Yeah, this is where Velociraptor is from. It's from the Gobi Desert. Across the southeast of the Mongolian Plateau. Yeah. The sixth lo and so this is sometimes called Inner Mongolia here, this region of China. Um, but that is very much part of China, you know? Largest desert in the world, yeah. which is extremely cold and arid, and where parts of it will receive no rainfall at all for years at a time. Overall, yeah. Mongolia has a very cold, dry, and windy climate. The southernmost third of the country is mostly a cold, arid desert, while the rest is mostly cold, arid steppe covered in seemingly endless grasslands with limited forest coverage in the north. Because of all these factors, only about 0.4% of Mongolia's vast amount of land is even considered arable and suitable for crop cultivation and agriculture. Wow. Excluding tiny yeah, there's a, there's a reason why, like, traditional Mongolian cuisine contains almost no vegetables. It's almost entirely meat, which is like, that's maybe one of the reasons why I haven't been to Mongolia yet. Ugh. <laughs> but, yeah. Tiny Pacific Island states and city-states, there were only three other countries in the world who have a lower percentage of arable land than Mongolia does. Djibouti, Iceland, and Oman. This also <laughs> means that despite being the 18th largest country in the world by overall amount of land, Mongolia also has less available arable land than Albania has got. <laughs> a country that is more than 54 times smaller in overall uh, area. That's funny. That simply means that developing a large-scale yeah. settled agricultural society across the Mongolian plateau is, for all intents and purposes, impossible. Instead, the vast and wide-open empty steppes covered in grasses are far more ideally suited for herding and ranching livestock, which can more mm. easily move around than settled farms and cities can. Nomadic herders can quickly take their livestock families and gurs across the flat steppe to different areas more suited to the season. Anyway, seasons. you get the idea. Mongolia, an interesting place. That's where Velociraptor is from. Uh, and it's very similar to Montana and Wyoming in a lot of interesting ways. Someday I'll, I'll go to Mongolia. I can recommend a book to you if you find this sort of thing fascinating. Oh man, do I have a book for you. Dinosaurs of the Flaming Cliffs by Michael Novacek is, in my opinion, one of the best books on dinosaurs ever written. One of the best written, one of the most interesting. Dinosaurs of the Flaming Cliffs. Uh, Michael Novacek's writing style is phenomenal. It is informative and engrossing, entertaining, without being pretentious or without dumbing things down, he just kind of strikes this perfect medium of uh, what science writing should be. It is excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Yeah. And Tommy Plotticus has bought this book off of Danny's recommendation. It's great. I'm glad you like it, Tommy Plotticus. Yeah. Superb. One of my very, very favorite uh, pieces of science writing anywhere. It is, it is phenomenal. Highly, highly recommend it. Um, and there's a, uh... Here, let's see. There's some lovely documentaries about this as well. Um... Here. We might watch part of this later. 80 million about years ago. After. Disaster came to a world ruled by dinosaurs. This 90s CGI. This is cutting edge stuff at the time. It came in waves of sand and wind. But this is not what we're here for. buried every creature alive. We're here for the documentary about... Well, footage of these paleontologists working out. In the Gobi Desert of For eons, the dinosaurs lay entombed in a place that would one day be called the Gobi Desert, yeah. in a country named Mongolia. Mongolia. Among the dead was one of the strangest dinosaurs that ever lived. It was called Oviraptor. It was swift, smart, 
Lethal. You get the idea. The folded lip. The reflection. Uncover the secrets of the Overraptor's world. Um, we'll probably return to this later on in the stream, I imagine. They don't exactly look like scientists. Often they're mistaken for each other. But Mike Novacek leads the expedition, along with colleague Mark Morrell. Yeah. They could be taken for surfers, but they're from the American Museum of Natural oh. History. Scientists oh, piecing together an Marlo ancient Red, jigsaw puzzle welcome, welcome. of evolution yeah. and extinction. Hmm. To me, it's so obviously important. I'm so emotionally bound up in this. I can't imagine why uh, a knowledge of of our history, of where we come from, isn't important to a human experience. Yeah. Could you imagine what it would be like to live in the late 20th century and not know that extinction actually existed? There's also just yeah. a sense of discovery. I mean, every bone that we find tells us something about how the world was 80 million years ago, which is, which is, is pretty neat. The hair looks just so having dry. a sense of history oh, yeah. of what the planet was Lydia. like and what the planet that's, has gone through. Movie. I think just increases our appreciation for our own existence. Yeah. The lack of surfboards is a giveaway that they're not surfers. Activities Mike and Mark are about Fair. to journey to the sun scorched badlands of the Gobi. It's a desolate area. A half million dusty square miles of sand, uh, scrub, and red rock cliffs. Gorgeous. Ah. Oh. Oh, someday. But it's a paleontologist version of heaven. Oh, yeah. For this is where the Overraptors oh, yeah. lived and died and lay untouched in the earth for millennia. Then in 1922, one of the most famous scientific expeditions in history wound its way toward Mongolia's dinosaur graveyard. Yep. The Central Asiatic Expedition. Its led leader by Roy was a charismatic and controversial explorer named Roy Chapman Andrews. I don't know how controversial he was at the time. Like Mark and Mike, he came from the American Museum of Natural History. But Andrews was an incurable publicity hound. Yeah. And a scientific cowboy. Where his paleontologist used a camel hair brush, Andrews hacked away with a pickaxe. Yeah, that's not Andrews there, that's somebody else. But he found one of the richest dinosaur boneyards in the world. Yep. That's not a dinosaur. He returned bone, with a spectacular collection of fossils. More mammal bones. And a library of stunning film images. But in the 1920s, communists yeah, yeah. seized power in Mongolia. The open door to the West slammed shut. For the next 65 years, the fabulous fossil fields of the Gobi were forbidden territory. Now everything's changed. Only token symbols of Russia's domination remain. Finally, Western scientists can return. What about, we don't want those onions. They, they rot. They rot in two days. So. Yeah. Mark and Mike were among the first scientists allowed yeah. in. They're now back for their sixth expedition with the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. So the, the, there were a bunch of Polish expeditions into Mongolia, the Polish-Mongolian expeditions. There were, uh, like... Polish Soviet expeditions. There was still science going on in the Gobi Desert during that time. That's a little bit misleading. They're like, oh, you know, the communists took over and then there's there's no more science going on. That's not true at all. Uh but anyway, it was the first time that Americans were let back in was in the, the early nineties, I believe. Yeah. Three kilos. Three kilos. Yeah. And there you go, activated complex, yeah. <laughs> Rock. There you go, fighter keeper, yeah. yeah. I don't think the 
this ever really did much work in Mongolia, if I could give They have just enough supplies for a short month and a long way to go. Retracing Andrew's footsteps on their way to one of the richest concentrations of fossils in the world, a place called Ukatolgad. Over a vast span of time, Ukatolgad was ruled by dinosaurs. Dinosaur history can be thought of as a great empire that lasted a few hundred million years. That's a significant slice of the history of life. Oh, yeah. It's impressive. Imagine. Oh, and uh, we're going to get into the we're going to get into the time. here. Oh, this is good stuff. Eric. Imagine that time from the moment the dinosaurs appeared till now is a single day. At okay. midnight. You got that? Imagine the time that the first you know, dinosaur evolved. That's the beginning of the day, and then the extinction of dinosaurs is the end of the day, or is it until the present? I don't know. Let's see. Appeared till now is a single day. Okay. At From the, the evolution of the first dinosaurs until us, you know, talking and typing right now on Twitch.tv, imagine that's a single 24-hour period. From the evolution of the very first dinosaurs until this exact moment, that's 24 hours. Dinosaurs appeared till now is a single day. Yeah. At mid We're maybe an hour old as a species, Finder Keeper? An hour? Oh, you'll see. Night. Dinosaurs first walk the earth. <laughs> They're flourishing at noon. They don't go extinct until five in the afternoon. Yep. Time passes. The first modern man finally appears a minute and a half before midnight. And even that, I think, is an exaggeration. I think it should be probably just like maybe 30 seconds before midnight, something like that. Because um, I'm guessing here they're saying like, oh, modern man appeared a million years ago. It's more like 200,000 years. I think that estimate has been has shrunk in the time since this was produced. All of our recorded history takes three and a half seconds. Yeah. Think about that. Everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, all of recorded history, civilization on Earth, three seconds long. Really puts things into perspective, right? Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. In Maybe the Gobi, kind of time seems to have stood still. The Gobi is such a big place, and it, it basically has no life support system. We really have to bring everything with us. So all our food, all our fuel, which we're carrying. Lydiness is more people need to hear this. It's such a healthy dose of perspective. You'd be shocked at the number of... Well, you maybe wouldn't be shocked. You would be perturbed um, to encounter people who uh, who recoil at that idea, who get angry um, when you give them that dose of perspective. And you're like, yeah, you know, we as human beings are very recent here on Earth. Life on Earth is almost 4 billion years old, and we're relative newcomers. A lot of people do not want to hear that. They will fight you. Um... Yeah, a lot of people are like scared of that very notion. And that must that must be lousy to be scared of the truth there, you know? To be scared of the idea of of scientific knowledge of, of discovery of Yeah. And the best way I know to to try and combat that, I guess, is by doing these live streams, by talking to folks, by you know, but yeah, and by conducting the research that I do, doing field work, trying to progress the field of paleontology forward, all of that stuff. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Salamander says, I don't like it in an existential anxiety way, but it's a crazy cool fact. Salamander, I think the more you think of it, the more those two will 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 merge, and the more you could just appreciate it as a crazy cool fact. Because, you know, we are incredibly small when it comes to the sheer scale of the universe or the sheer scale of 
what some people call deep time. I think that's kind of liberating in a way. You know, I get to be here for this brief moment and be part of this grand pageant of, of life on our planet. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Rocky Alter says, I, it's like thinking about the immensity of the cosmos. Yeah. For me, I can't quite wrap my head around it. But I can get just enough of an idea to pro be properly humbled and awed. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Activated Complex says, exactly. You let that fact wash over you. And go out this weekend and enjoy the sunshine and the stars at night. I appreciate how long it took to produce that moment. It's beautiful. Activated Complex. Yeah. yeah. And humans are not guaranteed immortality as a species. No. Like... <laughs> We've not been around for very long, and if things continue going the way they're going, we won't be around for very long. We gotta clean up our act. Yeah. Total perspective vortex. I don't, I don't know if I'm familiar with that. Never mind. Is it in one of the Hitchhiker's Guide books? I read the first one, not the second one. It's a long time ago. Dino Wolf, yeah, Velociraptor Awareness Day. That's what we're talking about today. Um, do we have any sense for where this came from? Velociraptor Awareness Day. Producing something that's a little bit better than that. I don't know. Shoot. Um, here's something from Fox 17 WXMI. I don't know what that is. It's a national holiday. West you, Michigan. You didn't know exist. We didn't. It's National Velociraptor Awareness Day. We are now. We're aware. <laughs> we're now celebrating. Holiday. Yes, it is a great day to look forward though to an event coming up in June, the Dino and Dragon Stroll. Mm. Uh, joining us nice right now to tell us all about it, it's Keith Aldridge, the owner of the Dino and Dragon Stroll, and he's got a, a looks like a friend with him. Ah. Good morning. Is it a yep. Good morning. How you doing? What great, is that one Keith. How are you? Good day. <laughs> Uh, doing really well this morning. Thank you. Are you scared to be sitting so close to that <laughs> uh, that creature? Nope. Nope. This is our uh, our friend here, uh, Ripley. Okay. And uh, no, he's a, he's a showstopper for us at, on the road and uh, and our dinosaur tour. So <laughs> no, he's really friendly. The kids love him. What is and, this supposed uh, to be? He brings a lot of excitement to our or... uh, our production. So tell us a little bit more about this production, what it's like, what people can expect a better uh, angle and when there. you're coming to GR. Mm -hmm. uh, we're coming to a GR in the first weekend of GR uh, Grand Rapids? June. And uh, Grand Rapids. you can expect a great, uh, uh, a great production, as I said, about a hundred different uh, dinosaurs and dragons. Uh, our tour is a little different than other oh, tours. Boy. We let our customers get up close and personal. As you can see, the uh, Video on, on your yeah, it looks like a lot of, you know, it, you deserve better than that. You deserve some actual decent information, not just sensationalism and tapes and colors. They deserve inspiration, enlightenment. I don't know, this feels like that. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Dinosaurs and Dragons is like fan fiction. Yeah, Diagonal. Yeah, that's disappointing. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. And 
there you go, Dinosaur Dave. Yeah, yeah. We've talked about that analogy before, like a, a sports field, a, a, a soccer field, a football field. As an analogy for the history of life on Earth. Um, it can be a good one. People are familiar with sports fields. Yeah, yeah anyway. Um, shoot, let's get back to... Maybe before we continue our... Uh, our little video about digging dinosaurs in the Gobi. Let's get back to this with Clint's reptiles. Talking about Velociraptor and Dromaeosaurs and all that stuff. And this is its claw. So that claw is actually properly sized. The skull is too big for a Velociraptor. You wouldn't want to fight this thing. It was around two meters long and half a meter tall, or about six feet long and less than two feet tall, and probably weighed about 15 kilograms, or a bit over 30 pounds. It would be worse to fight than Gus Gus. Heck, it would be worse to mm. fight than a Nile Monitor. Oh yeah. But, it's not gonna kill you. Even if you're a kid trapped in a kitchen. I don't know. People have been killed by birds before. Um... People have been killed by bobcats before, on very rare occasions. This would be like fighting a bobcat. You know? Against two of them with your... People have been killed by cassowaries before, for crying out loud. And they're not... They don't even have teeth or claws on their hands. You know? Uh... Yeah. Perennial video here. It's a moment of crisis. <laughs> what prompted such a desperate call to 911? It was a vicious physical attack, not from a human being, but from a bird. A bird called a cassowary, just like yep. the one behind me. It's known as. Rocky Alter says the cassowary's got that clawed foot, though. What do you think Velociraptor has? Um. Yeah, and Dr. Terra says, okay, but a cassowary is tears above a velociraptor? A cassowary is not even going to kill you to eat you. It's just going to kick you, you know? It's not going to hunt you in the same way that a meat-eating animal might. Uh, I don't know. I would definitely much rather have to go defend myself against a cassowary than against a, a living velociraptor, you know? Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. As the most dangerous bird in the world. The cassowary is a close descendant of the fierce velociraptors. Uh, close descendant. I'm not even going to comment on that. Dinosaurs featured in Jurassic World. Stand down. Who would keep such a creature as a pet? This man did. 75-year-old Marvin Hajos of suburban Gainesville, RIP. Florida. Yeah. His urgent call Florida to 911 man. came after he was attacked by his pet cassowary. In a fight between cassowary and man, he didn't stand a chance. Somehow, Hajos was able to call a friend, who then placed his own call to 911, urging police to get there quickly. He sounded really frantic on the phone. All he said was send an ambulance, send an ambulance, send an ambulance. Zookeeper Debbie Morganson uh. uses a rake, especially during breeding season, when the birds are protecting their eggs. The main thing you worry about is their feet, their most deadly weapon. She's correct. Cassowaries yep. don't bite. They use their claws, which can grow four inches long. This guy uses a thick shield to protect himself during an attack. It's more like running at you and, and kicking you and jumping at you with those, with those feet. And like a velociraptor, they're going to shred you pretty quick. Wildlife expert Jared Miller says the dead man might have made a mistake. That's a situation where you might have made a mistake. I don't know. I think he made several mistakes. Uh, R.I.P. Yeah. Where a little slip up like like a trip and fall definitely gave that large bird an advantage. Completely to death. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um. Uh. So yeah, yeah. You know, cassowaries are perfectly fine if you leave them alone. They're not gonna hunt you and try and eat you in the same way that a carnivorous animal will. I don't know. I I kind of think trying to fight a velociraptor might be kind of like trying to fight a... Uh, not to be 
something sensationalistic about it, but maybe like a small black bear or um, I don't know, a bobcat, a small mountain lion, something like that. A hawk, coyote, Dr. Terra, yeah, something like that, yeah. I don't know. I not a fight I would want to engage. You know. sister who prefers to be called a hacker, but we all know is a nerd. But this dinosaur, the species that they were actually facing in the kitchen, would totally kill you. A dromaeosaur almost twice the length of Velociraptor and weighing somewhere between 160 and 220 pounds, or 73 to 100 kilos. Yeah, good. He is talking about Deinonychus. I can tell. Good. This is good. And you'll notice that the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park... And mommy does his cats have the claws, though? I mean... What do you think Velociraptor? Velociraptor has got way bigger claws than any cat on Earth. Um, its claws are significantly larger than those of, like, even a, you know, an Amur tiger, which have, I think, the biggest claws of any modern cat. Um, it's got bigger claws, and it... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a Velociraptor would have claws larger than, than a grizzly bear. It's got them on their feet and, and on their hands. So yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Um, and Rocky says, the other side of it is that you wouldn't be fighting or running from just one Velociraptor, I'd imagine. We don't actually have evidence that Velociraptor hunted in packs. We do not have evidence of that. They might have, but we don't have evidence of that yet. Deinonychus is a different matter. It very well may have uh, may have hunted in packs, maybe, or maybe we just had mobbing behavior, or kind of like the Komodo dragons do. There is active debate about that in the paleontological community among dinosaur paleontologists who study dromaeosaurs. But I think you talk to most dinosaur paleontologists, and they would tell you that the. Reported evidence around pack hunting in dromaeosaurs, even Deinonychus, is probably a little overblown. But yeah, yeah. Uh, do any modern predatory birds hunt in packs? Not really, but yeah. Some birds will cooperate while they're hunting, but it's not it's not like a pack hunting thing like like wolves do. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and absolutely never winter, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we might talk about that, too, if we get to it. Um, but I want to... I want to continue here. And crows mobbing... Yeah, they're not really hunting when they do that, though, Sculpin. Um, they're mostly just trying to drive birds and prey away. gifted a tier one sub to Ole Teramu, thank you for that gift sub. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Teramu. Is that three today? I appreciate it. Yeah. are not only the wrong size, but their head shape is completely different as well. And yeah. that is because they're not simply overgrown velociraptors, swift plunderer, but rather Deinonychus, yeah. whose name Michael Crichton, the author of Jurassic Park, thought didn't sound as cool, but that means terrible claw. And as unpleasant as uh, this little velociraptor claw would be, the claw that Dr. Grant carried with him was considerably more terrible for sure. This skull from Deinonychus actually comes to me from Aldo from Dark Science Reptiles, uh, and he's got a really excellent YouTube channel and Instagram page, and so we'll have links to those down in the description. That's but this print. is... I've got the same thing right here. Deinonychus. Yeah. This is largely sculpted, though. Um, so this is kind of an older model of Deinonychus. You know? It's an old code, but it checks out. Uh -huh. Our current thinking on what the skull of Deinonychus looked like is, is a little bit different. Uh, yeah. There we go. 
it. So this is this is basically what I've got right here. The current thing as to what its skull would look like is a little bit more like this, I suppose. Yeah. Um, or like this. That's a pretty decent one right there. Yeah. Not too shabby. So it's a bit more boxy than the skull of Velociraptor with its really downturned Let's sound. Let's protect our fossils because if they're removed, America loses them forever. An Overload 4-2, thank you for converting from a Primer Gift Sub to a Tier 1 Sub Overload. Enjoy having those emotes at your command anytime you like them. Enjoy not having any ads. Enjoy not having to worry about uh, continuing that Prime Sub or anything. Thank you for that pledge of ongoing support. It means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's, you still see all of these, like, old, old style Deinonychus skull reconstructions all over the place, but since there's limited material that that's based on, you'll see a lot of reconstructions now that are kind of taking into account, like, Utah Raptor as, uh, as a model, and Velociraptor as well. Though Deinonychus is from much earlier in time than Velociraptor, a little bit after Utah Raptor. But yeah. yeah. Anywho. Um, let's continue. A 3D printed Deinonychus skull. And this shows off really nicely the difference in shape between the Velociraptor skull and the Deinonychus skull. And the Velociraptor skull be And look at this beautiful Tinamu bird, also a Manoraptor and dinosaur. This one's pretty excited about those 10 gift subs from Murph. Thank you, thank you, Murph. Look how excited this bird is getting. I'm too excited. Uh oh. Murph is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Holy cow, Murph! Do I appreciate that? Thank you, thank you. I'm sure the ten people in chat who just got a gift sub also appreciate it. We got a hype train going here. Beautiful. That is excellent. I appreciate that very much. Ten people in chat won't have to worry about any ads for the next 30 days. Thanks to your generosity, Murph. Thank you for being such a stalwart supporter of this community. It means a great deal to me and to everybody else here. Um, yeah, anyhow. Good stuff. Let's see how high we can get this high. Tradun. Uh, we are a little bit behind our sub goal this week. We've got today and tomorrow to try and get to 150. We'll see if we get any work close. But yeah, yeah. Anyhow, let's continue this surf party. And, uh, I'm really glad that, that Clint came up with, he realizes that the Velociraptors from Jurassic Park are Deinonychus. Because you hear all kinds of other people on YouTube and elsewhere going, Oh, well, you know, actually, they're uh, Dakota Raptor, or they're Utah Raptor, or something. And like neither of those dinosaurs had been named by the time that Michael Crichton was writing Jurassic Park. Utah Raptor, Utah Raptor itself, I think, was only published... I think after the first movie came out, because it was, what, April 1993 that Jurassic Park premiered? I think it was May or June of 1993 that Utah Raptor was even published. Uh, yeah. Being much more concave, the Deinonychus skull being much more convex, but likely due to limitations in the size of a 3D printer, this skull is not the full size for a Deinonychus skull. And this... Yeah would be a particularly large Velociraptor yeah, skull. This one's big, coming yeah. in at close to about nine and a half inches, which is about as big as those would ever, ever get. This is a... T yeah. Nine and a half inches is a little too big for a Velociraptor skull, honestly. Um, I've got one right here that's a cast produced by Rob Gaston, and that is life-size. Is This is a life-size uh, Velociraptor skull right there. Let's measure that, shall we? 
Get our meter stick here. One meter. And this comes out to 0.21 of a meter. 21 centimeters from the tip of the snout to uh, like where the occipital condyle would be. Yeah. 21 centimeters. Not, not huge. Yeah. Anywho, in Victarius. But those claws on the wings are once again invaluable. Thank you for using those wing claws. And thank you for the 22 months of support. Now at tier two, Victarius. Tier two. I appreciate that very much. Thank you for keeping me here on the air, Victarius. Good stuff. Very good stuff. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Let's continue. Uh, play. 10 inch Deinonychus skull, which would just be a juvenile because as adults, this skull would be 16 inches long, just like the skulls that were used to build the that's a little, that's a little, 16 inches is too long. No, I've got mine life size here. And that is 12 inches. Um, or, use a proper measurement system, just under 32 centimeters. Uh, 1,000 bits yeah. can make a wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Reesey, thank you, thank you for those 1,000 bits. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. <laughs> Holy moly. Level 3 complete. We're on our way to a level 4 hype train here. Beautiful. Very nice. I appreciate that, Reese. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, good stuff, good stuff. So yeah, I don't know where he got the 16 inches Deinonychus skull figure, that's way too big. About 12 inches is, uh, is about right for Deinonychus. They're not huge animals. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, yeah. Uh, extra aware of Velociraptors today. Good. Confused Echidna. It's good to have you here. So yeah, I, I don't know where he got that figure. 16 inches? I mean, shoot. Even if you just look at, like, Wikipedia. Shoot, unless Wikipedia is wrong about this. Let's see. Orbital skull elements, no femurs, no sacrum, no sternum, blah, 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 for their findings. Yeah. Skull, yeah, he got it from Wikipedia, I guess. Um, skull length of 16 inches. That's, I don't think anybody's ever found anything that big. That seems too large for Deinonychus to me. Uh, yeah. Uh, but studies of the skull have progressed a great deal over the decades. Ostrom reconstructed the partial, imperfectly preserved skulls that he had as triangular, broad, and fairly similar to Allosaurus. Yeah, but in fact, the palate was more vaulted than Ostrom thought, making the snout far narrower, while the jugals flared broadly, giving greater stereoscopic vision. Yeah. It would be nice if they actually had a figure of, like, a... a proper Deinonychus skull here, but they don't. Somebody ought to get on. Yeah. Any. Yeah. And Dromaeosaurs. I, I agree they need more. We need, we need more better fossils of them. For one thing. Anyway. Let's continue. Velociraptors in Jurassic Park. And both Michael Crichton and Steven Spielberg, the director of the movie, were careful to depict Deinonychus as accurately as they could. Though today we understand that... I mean, to a point. They didn't still make them too big. The, the 
velociraptors in Jurassic Park were bigger than actual Deinonychus because, for one thing, they had to make the... They had to fit a person inside. Let me show you. Here. From StanWinstonSchool.com. Stan Winston was like the special effects wizard. One of those involved with Jurassic Park. Did a lot of the animatronics and practical effects. Yeah. So what we're looking at here is a one-fifth scale model to test the proof of concept of putting a man inside of a raptor suit. And the yep. man that you're seeing right now is a model of me, John Rosengrant. I was inside the raptor costume along with uh, Mark Crash McCree. He was in another raptor. Yep. And what you're looking at right now is what the girls are doing is they're cutting up out of, out of foam and L200 a mock-up or a really elaborate garbage bag test of Raptor. And I call it a garbage bag test because that dates back to when we did Aliens for Jim Cameron. We can... So anyway, they had to actually make it big enough to fit a person inside it. And so it had to be bigger than the actual Deinonychus would be in real life. So yeah. We actually constructed a queen alien, full size, out of garbage bags and foam core, similar to this, but to prove that uh, proof of concept. And what we're doing right here is the same thing, it's just a little bit more elaborate version. Hmm. And if you frame out this figure from about the and knees you down, you can kind of see how it was going to be used. And in the film... There's, a, there's there's several scenes where it's used. There There's two the of them walking. Dinosaurs. And uh, engineering Arduino, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. Uh, it's good to have you here. Do you follow Nerduino, by the way? You'd probably really like his channel if you, uh, you're you into uh, that kind of tech. But yeah, yeah. In the kitchen, and, and we did exactly what we're talking about, framing it out from the knees down <laughs> here's some, some tests of it running so it's very organic and it was very mobile <laughs> so uh. it was trying to figure out all the ways to make this stuff work right now you're looking at a kind of an elaborate test of a neck mechanism that Stan had come up with it was very clever you can see Stan's kind of working on, with me, part of this chicken head bird-like movement. And huh. inside of it, I actually had rods that controlled the basic head move and tilt and, and turn. And so all of this was being refined during this process. And the idea was that the eyes and the jaw and the arms on it would end up being radio control but here's the beginnings of getting that sort of bird like head movement crash is, yeah and stan are joking around with but what we were doing is trying to work out the range of movement and stan's doing other things <laughs> <laughs> always the joker <laughs> but at this point what you're seeing is crash and i would train together and, and get ready for this but is that this crash point, mccreary rough like the, skins the concept on artist? this we're really starting to refine you know how it's going to work get control of the head <laughs> and at Avoid this point i think i may have control over the jaw and not you know to be honest i can't remember if that ended up being separate or not or if we ended up controlling no i actually I do remember now we have control over the jaw and huh. the head moves you can see it's come a long way since the very first test. Pretty cool. Here. It's very mobile. Now, these are the legs for the scene which was attached to the whole suit where I <laughs> step in the doorway and it stands up and it starts hooting for the other raptor to come in in the kitchen. Here it is with the paint is getting, you know, closer and more finalized. Yeah, Starting isn't that pretty neat? Really start to look like something at this point. And later we ended up getting the RC arms working to get a bit of motion there. We got a bit of blink. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this exclusive peek behind the scenes into uh, 
the making of the raptor suit for Jurassic Park. It's yep. it fun for me to look at this after all these years. It was quite a personal challenge, you know, physically very uh, demanding to be in these suits, but very rewarding to be part of this groundbreaking historic film. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, here is a link to that right here. And it's funny because in, if I remember correctly, in the novel Jurassic Park, the velociraptors were described as being like eight or nine feet long, about five feet tall, um, which is a, that fits with Deinonychus, really. Only in the movie are they so much larger, and that's largely because of the limitations of being able to fit a person in them, you know? So yeah, yeah. Uh, find your hand trick or treating out. Just put the fun size candies in the mouth, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Anyway, yeah. Good stuff. Um. So let's get back to this with uh, with Clint's reptiles. I like that we're kind of like hanging some of the stream around this video using it as a springboard for discussion. It's good stuff. That these dinosaurs were likely feathered and held their hands differently. A, yep. a friend of mine, Dr. Paul Bybee, was even consulted to find out if Deinonychus could have opened doors. Upon finding out that their forelimb morphology would not allow them to turn a doorknob, handle-style doorknobs were installed on the doors at Jurassic Park. Really? Oops. In retrospect, they should have installed regular doorknobs as well as locking mechanisms on the vehicle doors, and they probably shouldn't have hired Dennis Nedry. But they really were very careful to get Deinonychus right. They are even digging in the Badlands of North America for their Velociraptor. Montana. This is where Deinonychus is found. Yep. It is, interestingly enough, not anywhere close to Mongolia, where Velociraptor comes from. And, yep. and while I have He's heard right. people say that they think the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park were Utah Raptors, Utah Raptor was much bigger still than the dinosaurs in the movie. 23 yes, feet, 7 meters, yep. and 1,500 pounds. So yeah, it was, Utah Raptor is like the size of a pickup truck. Like, this is a big animal. That's a big animal. Um, holy moly. Yeah, and it also hadn't been published until after Jurassic Park came out, I think. Um... Jurassic Park, 1993, release date. Oh, June 11th, 1993, okay. Shoot, I'm gonna be in the field. Um, by the time that rolls around, the 31st anniversary. Uh, whereas, Utah Raptor, published also in 1993, Yeah. Was published in June 1993. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if it was before or after. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, Jurassic Park was already, you know, it was already well underway. In fact, there were plans to make a film before Michael Crichton had even finished the book. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll get into that in a little bit, too. Yeah, 1993. Let's find the original paper here. There it is. The Journal of Hunteria. You know, I've got it on my hard drive. I don't know why I'm trying to do this. Put a PDF library. Will it take? Here we go. Utah Raptor. There we go. Uh, so this would have been. Oftentimes at the very end, they'll say the publication date. June 18th, 1993. So there you have it, folks. Utah Raptor was published 
one week after Jurassic Park premiered. So for that and numerous other reasons, the Velociraptors from Jurassic Park cannot be Utah Raptor. They are not Utah Raptor. They were not Utah Raptor. So yeah. yeah. Anyway. And there is a Spielberg connection. Yeah, diagonal. So uh, Jim was talking about this. Let me see if I can find that clip um, from this past summer when I was in the field with Jim Kirkland, the discoverer and namer of Utah Raptor. somewhere in here um, let's see reopening the quarry Jim didn't get there until a few days in it might be here let's see but at one point, I, I interviewed Jim about a lot of these dromaeosaur things. Well, it doesn't seem to have been in this iteration here. Jimbo Slice one up. Hey, thank you for being here. Good to see you. Uh, try this. We'll get to that in a bit. Yeah, I do have a photo of a Utah Raptor Spielberg Eye t-shirt. Oh, that's exactly what we were talking about. Yeah. Good stuff. Here, we'll, we're getting some questions about Utah Raptor. We'll get to that in a bit, I think. But somebody's got a question about Spielberg and his oversized dromaeosaurs and stuff uh, like that. I think I think we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah, I do have a photo of a Utah Raptor Spielberg eye T-shirt. Oh, <laughs> oh but uh -huh. not here. Like, so originally, the, shirts. <laughs> the species name for Utah Raptor was going to be Utah Raptor Spielberg eye instead of Utah Raptor Ostromesi. Uh, but I think Jim was saying that they were they were trying to get some funding from Amblin Entertainment or Universal Studios or Steven Spielberg himself, something like that. And it just it just wasn't working out. And they needed to publish this thing, and so they just gave it a different species name instead. It's an interesting story, so we'll get that to that. It is an interesting story, and I was basically had a gun to my head. Uh, yeah. Right. Ostrom deserved it. No doubt. Oh, yeah. John Ostrom, absolutely. Yeah, here. So let's scoot forward to... Mm -hmm. I was talking with Jim over here. Really good. What do you want to know? Yeah. Utah, with the Utah Geological, Utah Geological Survey crew. Um, yeah, and we're digging up some dinosaurs in the earliest Cretaceous Cedar Mountain formation. This is Weird, there's a rare cloud overhead that's making everything look so dark. About 140 million years old, about twice as old as like Triceratops or Tyrannosaurus. Um, yeah, and a little bit older than Utah Raptor also. Jim Kirkland, the state paleontologist for the great state of Utah, uh, he named Utah Raptor. I know we've got some Utah Raptor enthusiasts in chat, so we're going to do some talking about Utah Raptor right now, and he's got some claws that he's brought with him. So, uh, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Let's scoot forward uh, here and go where Phil was just standing. Yeah, here we go. That keeps it pretty simple. Yeah, one that small, you don't have to bother. So I would yeah. just, you don't need to put any... Let's see. Yep. Yep. All right. Nobody seat. knock over the camera there. Yeah. Hey, folks. <laughs> Watching an old man moving. <laughs> All right. Jim Kirkland, ladies and gentlemen. Doctors tell me I can't re replace my knees to make it better. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, this is. And uh, Dino Wolf, that's not actually true. So Bob Bacher wrote Raptor Red. I think it was published in like 1995, which was a couple years after Jurassic Park came out, after the movie came out. The book Jurassic Park was published in 1990, long before Raptor Red was even a glint in Bacher's eye. Um, but yes, indeed, the uh, the Raptor, the Dromaeosaur they picked in the in the movies was Deinonychus for sure. 
Yeah. This is Dr. Jim Kirkland, the state paleontologist for the state of Utah. And, uh, yeah. Jim, did you just name and describe Utah Raptor, or did you discover it as well? What's the... Well, I discovered <coughs> the first bones at the Gaston Quarry. Gotcha. So you're co-discoverer, I guess, yeah. Yeah, there were, there were things that just no one knew about. Right. You know, yeah. and, uh, and there's probably pieces that are in private collections that uh -huh. we don't know about still. Right, and, yeah. You know, I mean, the stuff I, co -dis I discovered uh -huh. at BYU uh -huh. in a drawer of pieces, and it was like theropod indeterminate. Mm -hmm. And it was determinant, you know. <laughs> Because it's like, this is Utah Raptor. So people have been so digging It's, 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 it's an animal. Time. Yeah. But uh, let's see. I got this one. Nice. Uh, this so Jim one. very kindly brought along some props from Salt Lake. Yeah. Okay, there's nothing there. But important stuff for our discussion. By the way, Dan, thanks, Phil. Yeah, thank you, Phil, for, for, the, idea. for the idea. I appreciate it, Phil. And that is not or that is not Dinonychus, but I know this is nice this is a ch and it's funny so Jim says Dinonychus Jack Horner says Dinonychus too I think John Ostrom said Dinonychus uh anyway it's a tomato potato kind of situation it doesn't really matter say whatever you want as long as people know what you're talking about cheap cast yeah uh, of Yale's type specimen of Dinonychus. Right, so this is the Velociraptor from yeah. Jurassic Park. And this here. the third Dromaeosaur ever described. Uh huh. Yeah, after Dromaeosaurus and Velociraptor. And maybe Ornitholestes too? Nobody seems to be quite sure about that critter. I should ask Jim about that. Is Ornitholestes, could it be a Dromaeosaur? What's going on with that animal? Uh, yeah. Uh, Dromaeosaurus, Velociraptor, Dinonychus. Yeah, yeah. That's the first two were Dromaeosaurus, then Velociraptor, then mm -hmm. Dinonychus. And Dinonychus is quite a bit bigger, because if you want to see... Let's bring the camera closer, actually. That'll be good. want to see a Velociraptor. There's a claw <laughs> of Velociraptor. Reptile. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's almost like a transatlantic, like, very old-timey... Yes, yeah, so he's... These flying raptors. <laughs> that's a that's an accent that's been lost to time. Again, yeah, yeah. Dinicus. Is that a, a Rob Gaston cast right there? Yeah, yeah. Nice. That's from a good Mongolian velociraptor. That's beautiful. It's so yeah. complete and smooth. Oh yeah, they got yeah. You know, beautiful complete sky. They have the most. They molds of uh -huh. the best preserved velociraptorine skull right. ever found. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just an incredible thing. But uh, here's Dionychus, quite a bit bigger. One of the things that's really characteristic of these guys is the asymmetric blood groove. Yeah. You know, yeah. you have to supply the blood to the mm -hmm. tissues growing. Yeah. The claw. And, you know, what... Yeah, here, so this doesn't get too long. Let's fast forward a little bit. Oh, and yeah. So there's... on this side, it goes way up toward the top. And then on this side, it's more toward the middle, like the midline yeah. laterally of the claw. That's right Velociraptor right, right look... there. So and not huge. There. Yeah. yeah. And this side here, mm -hmm. it's symmetrical. Right. And look how broad the base is. Yeah. I mean, when we reconstruct the sheath of the claw proper, mm -hmm. you know, this is the angle. Well, here's the claw of reconstruction. That's the keratin over the top, yeah. yeah. It's like a bear claw. Mm -hmm. And you look at this wide base, it probably had a double carina, like you see on most right, normal right. big claws. Uh -huh. And this would, you know, Allosaurus, this is a thumb claw, uh -huh. but rake through and cause some serious damage. I don't know if it's a raking through. I Jim and I have got sort of different ideas about this. I think these are more hooks for just like holding on to prey. The idea of like slashing with a claw like this uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But these are difficult ideas to really test. You know, you could look at modern animals and how they use their claws, and basically nobody like slashes with hook like claws like this. You could say that cassowaries do that, but their claws are much more straight. They don't have that that nice recurved kind of nature to them. Huh. But it's not a like not, a meat hook. Yeah, yeah. I was right. Yeah. More like a hook, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. That is, yeah, yeah, for grasping. And you know, this probably added strength, but this double carin is very prevalent in mammals too. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like the but, canine uh, teeth in claw, mammals. Claw, yeah, yeah. Keep that in mind. Yeah. But you know, why are they asymmetrical? The blood groove. I. Yeah. It's they don't snap in half. 
He got me. Would with imagine this one. if they're using it to hook into prey. This is my guess that like it's going toward the sagittal plane. So like you're kind of going inward or maybe it, outward. It has nothing to do with biomechanics. Okay. okay. Remember, it's completely covered by the keratin. Sure. No muscles attach anywhere near that. Yeah. So, you know, so, so why would stresses. why would that be asymmetrical in ease? I don't know. Yeah. Is this breaking? We're working with an artist, you know, because uh -huh. artists notice things that paleontologists sure. don't always notice. Yeah. You know, I have a lot of respect for paleo artists. Uh, I don't always agree with them, but I have a lot of respect <laughs> for them. But you look at this and you, you know, say, okay, it's flat. The groove's in different positions. Uh -huh. The artist goes, well, it's structural. Mm -hmm. If the claw was symmetrical, you'd have this real weak spot because it would come so close together. Sure. You know, the center of the claw. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah so by displacing it, would be bowed instead, in of, like instead that. of having this point where it would break easy, yeah, yeah. you've got this, and it makes real sense. Hmm. You know, and, uh -huh. you know, and I know it in the paper I described Utah Raptor, uh -huh. that this guy figured this out, and I agree with him. I think it right. explains so it. So maybe like the smaller the claw is, the more you have to have those displaced <clears throat> in order to help prevent it from breaking. Because yeah. It's, yeah. But basically... So like Allosaurus wouldn't have to worry about that because the claw itself is already pretty thick. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That it's, makes sense. Yeah, it really does. It's just yeah. like, you know, you say the mouth of babes. This is a <laughs> sharp guy, you know. Uh -huh. This paleo artist had a lot of skills. But anyway... You know, when we first were working on the Gaston quarry across the way at the first site, uh -huh. we had in this side of the Paradox Basin and Cedar Mountain that we worked. Uh -huh. BYU had been working Dalton Wells for 30 years. Uh -huh. uh, before that, you know, as we're digging, I found part of a theropod jaw. Sure. You know, exciting, and I'm working on it, and there's some ribs, and there's a tibia of the theropod right there. Mm -hmm. And this guy starts calling over to me, Jim, Jim, I think I've got a weird-looking cervical rib. And this is all limestone, it's real yeah. hard quarry to work. Yeah. Uh, it's hard on your knees and everything else. Now this is the Gaston quarry. Yeah, it's all bases, total limestone. And uh, I mean, you know, half a meter thick or more. You know, real hard unit, you know. You know. Mm -hmm. And basically, I go, he finally goes, you really should take a look at it. And I came over and looked down <laughs> and I could see about that much of yep. this thing. That's not a cervical rib. You know, and clearly, you know, discovery mark at the tip. Uh-huh. You know, and I'm like, oh, look at that groove. And then you yeah. lay my head down on the rocks to see this because mm -hmm. you had it coming around. I'm like, that's a, a dromaeosaur claw of some sort. <laughs> it's huge. And I only could see this much of it yeah. at the time. Yep. I said, Carl, we got to see the rest of this. I want that's coming with us. This is our last Utah day. Rapper. Okay. You know, that first season. Yeah. yeah. You know, we got to get this out of the quarry. Uh -huh. So, impressive. boom, uncovers this. And it's like, that's twice the size of Deinonychus. Easily. Yeah. And Don Burge and, you know, guys, because I had the Cloverly book with me. And Dino Wolf, yeah, Bob Bunker always tries to talk about how, oh, I was the real dino con dinosaur consultant on Jurassic Park, and yeah, he uh, he really plays that up. But anyway, yeah, uh -huh. John Ostrom was being very helpful as always, yeah. and he sent it to me because he I'm working on ankylosaurs uh -huh. in the early Cretaceous, and it describes Sauropelta. But he had a picture of the claw uh -huh. of Dinonychus, and you know, here's Dinonychus. What's funny is that uh, Dino Wolf, when when Jim Kirkland had the Utah Raptor uh, claw cast and he brought it to SVP, apparently Bob Bacher went up to him and is like, let me see that. He's looking at it and he goes, this isn't a dromaeosaur, this is just a crushed Torvosaurus claw, and like hands it back to him. Um, so like Bob Bacher basically discounted the the existence of Utah Raptor from the very beginning. Only then came around and was like, oh, yeah, Utah Raptor, yeah, oh, yeah. Jim might even tell that story here. We'll have to see. There's a scale on the claw, and I'm going, look, it's twice the size. <laughs> and then you guys, no, no, it's probably the scale's wrong. <laughs> it's probably, this is a Dionychus. It has to be. It's early Cretaceous. Uh -huh. All early Cretaceous dromaeosaurs in North America have to be Dionychus. <laughs> uh, well, I don't think so. I think this uh -huh. is a big thing. So a week later, San Diego... I uh, went to the, the SVP meeting, Society of Herbert Here we go. meeting, mm -hmm. and I go to the back door, and there's Bob. And yeah, <laughs> there you go again, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, so, shoot. I'm not going to show that clip, but, you know, the Bob Bakker stand-in character in The Lost World gets eaten by the Tyrannosaur, um, because well, one of the reasons was that Jack Horner, who was the paleontological consultant on the Jurassic Park films. He was so tired of Bob Bakker 
saying this and that about being a consultant on the Jurassic Park film. So he's like, yeah, I'll put you in the movie, but you're going to get eaten. <laughs> anyway, no, you're good, Ken. You're good. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, Jim is about to, about to tell the story here. I think this uh, is a big thing. So a week later, San Diego uh, went to the, the SVP meeting, Society of Herbert Paleo meeting. Mm -hmm. And I go to the back door, and there's Bob Bacher. Yeah. Sitting, holding court with his acolytes, <laughs> you know, on a, sitting, sitting up on a table, and everybody's uh -huh. around him. It's, it's, it's a classic Bacher scene. <laughs> and I, I had the, this cast, yeah. you know, to, Rob, uh, to Bob, and he looks at it. Rolling his mustache. <laughs> junk. Hands it back to me. Just junk. <laughs> and I'm like, Bob, I think this is a giant dromaeosaur you know, sickle claw. Uh -huh. And he gets it again, looks at it. Just a crushed Torvosaurus claw. And Torvosaurus <laughs> claw in outline is almost identical, except uh -huh. it's equal the silcus thickness. Would be, the thick. silcus would be a little bigger, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's yeah. that thick. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a, like an allosaur claw. But yeah. in side view, it's almost identical hmm. in, in form. But it's a big, thick mantis claw, you know, from uh -huh. a medium dinosaur. So I'm going, ha, ah, I'm going to go show John Osram. Mm -hmm. You know, so I go on in, yeah. and uh, Jim Madsen, uh, the first day paleontologist, is sitting there talking to John Ostrom, yeah. and I hand this to John, and I think Madsen had warned him that I had this thing or something, because he just <laughs> takes it, and you you know how big that, you put the sheath on that thing, and it would have been like this long, <laughs> and that thing, would, and he just starts swinging this thing around, and, you know, and I was feeling, feeling very vindicated. Yeah. <laughs> You know? I can imagine. Yeah, uh, you know, swing of this. I mean, he really was. He's like, oh man, that would be great. You know, and he's uh -huh. just going for it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, it was vindication. And of course, John made sure immediately when he got back to Yale, he sent me the Dinicus monograph. Nice. Yeah. You know, and he said, yeah, you need this, but you've got something new there, I think. Uh huh. And uh, you know, it's with a polycanthine, not not a notosaur. Uh huh. So I got pretty excited about that. You know, working the site. Yeah, this is on camera. I found this claw, probably the other side of the same animal. <laughs> it's not as good a cast because this should be better you know, done. Yeah. Uh, and that's also from the gas Yeah, it's probably the other claw, but one of the things, look at the difference. This is by left and right from the same animal. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. You know, it's it pretty be a remarkable lot of... you know, how different they are. This is really funny because there are paleontologists working today who are like, oh, well, if they've just found that claw, they'd be a little... Look at how different it is. It's got to be a new species, new genus of dromaeosaur. Look how different it is from Utah Raptor. It's like, no, those are probably two claws from the same individual animal, left and right. And they look that different. You know? I. Yeah, but splitter's going to split, you know? Yeah. One of the things, look at the difference. This is by left and right's. From the same animal, uh -huh. you know. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> it pretty be a remarkable. Yeah, you know, how different they are in overall curvature and morphology. Yeah, and Dionychus same way. There's Dionychus claws that are almost straight. Yeah, you know, as well as ones that are deeply hooked. But you can't name new taxa based on claw morphology. Yeah, like just that. the claw. Uh, you know, yeah. and you know, I bring that cast with me to the Hollywood. Dinosaur Club meeting because the animation's based uh -huh. out of California. Yeah, and I'm passing this. I'm realizing I need to, while I'm there in person listening to Jim speak or somebody else, I need to stop with the inane interjections. That yeah, uh huh, yeah, it doesn't add anything to the conversation. I'm bugging myself listening to this. I'm like, be quiet. Let the man talk. Club meeting because the animation's based uh -huh. out of California. Yeah. And I'm passing this cast around the room, and this guy goes, ah, that's pretty neat, and pulls this out of his coat. Uh -huh. So take a look at this, and hands it to me, and I'm looking at it. God. This isn't real. You know, <laughs> this is, what is this? And he goes, that's Spielberg's Raptor. You know? <laughs> and this first I'd heard, they're making it big. Right. You yeah. Know? And looking at it, going, well, it's biologically not even a proper curve. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's just like no animal has a claw that curves like that. Uh huh. You know, and the texture is more like a ram's horn. Yeah. It's yeah it's supposed to be light. It's supposed to be keratin going over it. Uh huh. Look how thick. Look at how you know short and narrow mm -hmm. that cutting like edge is. Like a knife. Is. Yeah. 
you know, and that's the one in the movie. Uh -huh. Even in Jurassic World, there's a point where so they have it tapping on the table. Like, My claw, there it is. You know, <laughs> that's close up. But that's the one from Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Uh -huh. Here's the bone. But, you know, we were looking at this. It's like, okay, well, that's a bone, and they're about the same size. What would it look like if you did put the sheath over it? Yeah. And knowing what I knew about you, allosaurs and things. Is it anxiety? No, it's just active listening, and I think I'm closer to the microphone, so it's picking that up more. I just need to remember to to nod more and be less uh, obnoxious with with my active listening, I guess. Uh, Thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's reconstruct it, and let's be conservative scientists. Mm -hmm. We know it could be 50% longer than the ungul. Sure. And many birds yeah. it is. Uh-huh. And just match it up and make it like we think it is. As you see, this is how we reconstruct the sheep. This is art of yeah. interpretation. This mm -hmm. is when I'm normally talking to Jim, I'm gonna be nodding and saying, Mm-hmm, yep, yeah, hmm. Really? Uh I need to remember to not do that while I'm on camera. That's what I'm saying here. Is that when we're producing a a live stream like this, I gotta I gotta work on that. Just let the man speak. Science, and even though it's a cast, it's pretty accurate to the real thing. Thank you, which Goldman. is in a museum. That's mm -hmm. They keep it. They well, it's on exhibit, but they all, used to keep it in a safe because <laughs> they were so afraid. You know, Jeez. it was so famous. This is at BYU. While. No, this is at Prehistoric Museum. Of Tons, oh yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, you know, which has got all the site material. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it and compare that, which I always like to say, you could shave with. <laughs> it's uh, so it's so knife-like on yeah, the ventral it, side. It, it is so narrow. I mean, look, look you at really that think edge. It was like that? Oh yeah, I mean huh. this, this this edge comes right up. Oh yeah, because that's that's one of the ideas where like I don't see dinosaurs like Deinonychus or Velociraptor slashing with those toe claws mm -hmm. because it no, they couldn't. It's it because basically uh -huh. I always tell people, look, you know, it's my my raptor's bigger than Spielberg's raptor. <laughs> Remember that? Uh, it almost became Spielberg eye, uh -huh. except they sued the Peabody Museum and a number of other museums. Oh, they were geez. using Jurassic as a part of the title of exhibits. Yeah, huh? you know, and lawyers got to do that because why didn't you just you know uh -huh. sue all these guys if someone was really ripping them off? Yeah, so I, you, know, you know, intellectual property lawyers are pretty ruthless. Uh -huh. They sued every, I mean, they sued all these little tiny museums that you know that don't charge to go in. Yeah, you know, doing yeah. little Jurassic sideline exhibits and things. Uh -huh. But anyway, I had a gun to my head. But that's that's the reason why it didn't become Utah Raptor Spielberg guy, I suppose, is he was going to do that and then. Universal Studios started suing different museums over the use of the term Jurassic in their exhibits. They were trying to, uh, I guess, claim that that was like a copyrighted term or something. Yeah. Yeah. I had to rename it. Yeah, yeah. it was in proof to be named Spielberg Eye. Shoot. And it was like, so you want your job? You got to change the name. Utah Raptor Spielberg Eye. <laughs> Yeah. You know. Well, I guess but, we've you've got an opportunity to do that now with the new Utah raptor a new species. new one, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we do have what's probably a new species of Utah raptor from younger rocks, from the poison strip level, which is that big sandstone rim around us, hmm. and it's from a site called the Lori site. And if you look at this, there's some differences. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah, a thicker know, thing, right? but it's not as crushed, but uh -huh. it's still narrow. At the edges, you know. You, there would be a sharp edge on that. Uh -huh. It's a little bit smaller, but, you know, heck, the other side. Diagonal says that would be like suing Naval History Museums for using the name Titanic. Yeah. I don't know what the the parent company is for uh, for that film. What was the studio for Titanic? But, yeah, it, that they didn't do that to my knowledge. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Side is a little bit smaller than this one, uh -huh. so there's a certain asymmetry. Sure. You know? But uh, you look at this. Yeah, Gogan, like, I'm like... not defending that. No, there's no reason in the world why they should claim, like, oh, we have copyright over the word Jurassic. Like, the heck you do. This is a... It belongs to everyone. You can't copyright something like that, you know? Yeah, it's literally, in the scientific literature, it's literally... In the field of geology, uh, yeah, million years yeah. later, yeah. So that's all we got. We can't, you know. I named Utah Raptor initially on the claw. We got other bones that we added into it. Sure. 
But uh, this, you know, we can't name this. Right. Because it's like, as far as we can tell by diagnosis, this would be Utah Raptor 2. Sure. And it, 10 million years, the it's chances be very it's still yeah. Utah Raptor is nil. Yeah. And we're starting to think more and more of this. We may have a subfamily of dromaeosaurs like we have Velociraptor. Thanks, uh -huh. Daisy McCarthy. And dromaeosaurines. Mm -hmm. And have Utah Raptorines uh -huh. as a lower Jurassic group. And there's lower suggestions... Uh -huh. that actually the pelvis of Utah Raptor might be like Achille Batar in the late Cretaceous of Mongolia, mm -hmm. which is the, the next biggest right. known dromaeosaur. Uh -huh. And it may be a late-occurring Asian Utah Raptor. Which would be super cool. Which Yeah, is, yeah. and we've yeah. got the fossils in the mega block. Yeah. You know, we have pelvic bones, and we just yeah. got to prep them. So last yeah. summer you were telling me that you thought maybe Achille Batar was maybe a Tyrannosaur? Yeah, because... What, what changed? Yeah, well, basically... And it's if you'd come to MTE and looked at the poster uh -huh. uh, or my talks, and they're online. Don't look at Kirkland, uh, Feathering <laughs> uh, Utah Raptor. I've got an hour and a half talk where I point all this stuff out. Yeah. But the ischium, the, the, the pelvic bone in the hind part mm -hmm. of the pelvis, flares out, and it's, it's, it's got the obturator process, which we don't have a pelvis here. Mm -hmm. But the thing a little sticks out usually right by the pelvis, all the way down almost the end. Yeah. And that's how it is in Archaeopteryx, sure. Velociraptor, yeah. Truodonids, uh -huh. oh, you know, it's like all manner raptorans. Yeah. You know, and the pelvis style, you know, this ischium that we have that may be Utah Raptor, certainly in Achille Batar, mm -hmm. looks much more like what we see in Tyrannosaurs in it being a primitive character. Right. Uh, you know, these animals before they have Uh-huh. I forgot about that. And if you look at some characters of this animal, the tail is not as stiffened. You know, it's more like Archaeopteryx's tail. Sure. You know, this this style of animal may be closer to what gave rise to birds. Mm -hmm. And that Velociraptorines and Microraptorines, which also have a very stiffened tail, mm -hmm. are actually a later specialized side branch. Hmm. Uh, where this thing is, it's, it's large body size uh -huh. is what makes it unique, hmm. you know, in terms of its niche within the ecosystem. Uh-huh. But its ancestor is actually, it's closer to bird origins uh -huh. than cool. Velociraptorines or Deinonychus. Sure, yeah. Uh, but more to do. If I lived another 100 years, maybe I could be a part of it. But unfortunately, I doubt that's going to happen. <laughs> so maybe one of you watching uh, will get involved and, and be able to figure out this story. Mm -hmm. But these stories are figure out a bull. Yeah, you know, the answers like are out there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like these things are... Those are impossible questions that man will never, <laughs> you know, be able to figure out. New discoveries oh, yeah. and, and focusing on new areas will give us search images that will result in discoveries that will help hone in on the story. Yeah. And that's good stuff. That's just really exciting. <laughs> awesome. Uh, 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 if you want to watch the rest of this, here's a link. Uh, and, uh... I guess let's finish out this video with uh, Clint's reptiles here. Again, the dinosaur that Jim was talking about, Utah Raptor, this size compared to a human person there. Pounds, almost 700 kilos. Deinonychus yeah. is not only the right size gravity, yeah. found in the right yeah. place, but also has the right head shape. So why does it have the wrong name? That is the fault of paleo artist Gregory S. Paul and his book, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World. In this... Yes! Ah, this is exactly what I was telling you at the beginning of the stream. I'm so glad that Clint got this right. I was a little worried. Man, kudos to him. He did his homework. In this book, Gregory Paul determined that Velociraptor from Mongolia and Deinonychus from North America were sufficiently similar that they should be classified as being parts of the same stuck genus. The landing. Yeah, finder and Gabriel. since Velociraptor yeah. was the earlier genus known to science, that genus should be Velociraptor. Thus, he concluded that Deinonychus was a species of Velociraptor. This idea never gained much footing in the scientific community, but it did nope. with Michael Crichton, who referenced Paul's work in the acknowledgments to Jurassic Park. So there isn't much support for the idea that Deinonychus is a velociraptor, but they're both related. They're both dromaeosaurids, running lizards. Yep. Though just to be clear, no dinosaurs are actually lizards. Dromaeosaurids have been found on every continent except Australia, but teeth have been found there as well. So 
they were probably found all over the globe. And they appear in the Jurassic, but were most prevalent in the Cretaceous. Overall, yep. you're probably pretty familiar with their body plan. They were bipedal, with big, sickle-shaped claws on their interior toe. And Paleocensis deinonychus is a lot smaller than the JP raptors. I mean, we talked about why. That may have been before you showed up, but uh, that is actually a product of when they were building the uh, uh, the suits, they had to fit a human being in them. Yeah, I'm check it out. Here is a one fifth scale model to test the proof of concept of putting a man inside of a raptor suit. And the yep. man that you're seeing right now is a model of me, John Rosengrant. I was inside the raptor costume along with. So if that's why they had to make them bigger than they're described from about in the, the knees book. Down. You can kind of see how it was going to be used. They had to make and it big enough film, for this guy to fit in. There's, a, there's, uh, there's several scenes where it's used. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Here, let's continue here. You're good, Unlike Kevin. what is depicted in Jurassic Park, it now appears that they were heavily feathered. In some, like Microraptor, they were likely capable of powered flight. And their gliding, eyes pointed somewhat forward, so they probably had better binocular vision and depth perception than most dinosaurs. And British says, as a kid at the time, that was my dream job, and I was perfectly trained for it. What? However, their close relatives, lost the Troodontids, may have had even better binocular vision. Members of the family Troodontidae were found at the same time oh, the and suit in guy. many gotcha. of the same yeah. locations as their dromaeosaurid relatives also looked fairly similar to the dromaeosaurids the except is. their toe claw was not as heavily curved they also seem to have preyed on smaller prey than dromaeosaurids and as a result were more lightly built with it's... small closely spaced teeth on their bottom Lots jaws in yeah. addition to having great binocular vision they also had very large brains for dinosaurs of their size only the aviale had bigger brains. And aviale is an amazing clade to end with because members of this clade are still alive today. Yep. Though certainly not all. Aviale means birdwing, so try to guess what this clade has. Though not all of them necessarily do. Though it is often defined as all dinosaurs, including modern birds, more closely related to modern birds than to Deinonychus, in which case it would likely include the Troodontids. This clade likely includes dinosaurs, such as Archaeopteryx, unless it is actually a dromaeosaurid, and the Enantiornithines, also known as the opposite birds. Opposite because they seem to be a convergence on the bird body form. And their wing shoulder morphology is opposite to that of birds. Socket and ball instead of ball and socket. Also, like many other primitive birds, they had teeth and claws on their wings, though claws and which which paper is that, Ken? Um, I'm not sure what paper you're referring to. Blood yeah. wings are still seen on juvenile Watsons. That thing is a dinosaur for sure. And it also includes the birds, the only living dinosaurs. And yep. that is a decent introduction into the Manny Raptor and dinosaurs. What group should we cover next? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to yeah, see you real soon. Stuff. Here is a link to that video from Clint's Reptiles. Good work on his part. That's probably the best video that I've seen on YouTube describing the whole, like, Velociraptor, Deinonychus, Utah Raptor, Jurassic Park thing. He got it right. Good for him. Yeah. Um... Oh, referring to the people who were saying uh, dromaeosaurs are secondarily flightless. I think that's another Greg Paul idea. I don't know if he's ever actually published that in a paper peer review. I think he's kind of hinted at that in several of his books. And probably several talks and stuff like that. But I don't know if he's ever actually uh, published on that in anything peer reviewed. Yeah. Dynamo says someone made a paper saying Scipionix is a juvenile spinosaurid. Really? Dino Wolf, have you got a. Shoot, is that new? I'd love to, love to see a link if you've got that. I remember um, Andrea Cow, uh, Italian paleontologist, 
Ital I think Italian paleontologist, um, was saying in a blog post that Scipionics and, um, and some of the other, like, Compsognathid dinosaurs, Compsognathus, Sinusoropteryx, might be juvenile Carcharodontosaurs. Whatever Scipionix is, it is definitely a juvenile. It's like, it's the thing's a hatchling. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. But, um, I don't know if anybody's really looked into that further. If it's been published in a peer-reviewed journal, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Uh, that is popular with someone trying to, that idea is popular in China. Interesting, Ken, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, a new giant snake. I've seen a headline for that, Dr. Terra, but I haven't actually read the paper yet. And also, Belint and I were talking all about giant ichthyosaurs last night. And then, like, I think just before we went live with that, the one of those was named um, Ichthyotitan, I think, was the genus name. I want to say Dean Lomax is involved with that. So yeah, yeah, we've got various gigantic non-dinosaurian reptile fossils. <sighs> Just been named. It's interesting stuff. We'll probably talk about some of that tomorrow, but right now, it's Velociraptor Awareness Day. So we're going to continue with that. Um, yeah. A fully grown ichthyosaur? I mean, we don't know if it's full grown British or Maybe they got bigger than that. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. I figure we'll continue this for a little while. And a fuel tanker. All our supplies have to be treated like we're actually exploring a polar region. In such a vast area, success is never certain. Even getting there can be a nightmare. Uh, luckily, our fieldwork in Wyoming is not going to be quite as remote as this. <laughs> Roy Chapman Andrews thought he'd solved the problem in the 20s with a new piece of technology. A motor car. When it was announced that we were to attempt a scientific exploration of the Gobi Desert with a fleet of motor cars, men said that we were little less than fools. Only camels had been used in that country. We had 40 men, 8 motor cars, and 150 it's camels to exactly carry supplies. Dragon, yeah. It was the biggest land scientific expedition ever to leave the United States. Roy Chapman Andrews. From China, Andrews headed northwest. He left Peking, then crossed over the border and drove deep into the parched heart of outer Mongolia. Mongolia, a land of painted deserts dancing in mirage. Mongolia, a land of mystery, of paradox and promise. A thirsty land. A land of desolation. <laughs> Gazelles, wild asses, and wolves ranged the marching sands. Few explorers had been there, and they brought back tales of thirst, cold, and hunger. But Andrews found one more thing. Mud. Oh, great. <laughs> Our average speed was only four miles an hour. Rocks, ravines, washouts, and ditches followed one another in rapid succession. One might imagine that the roads have gotten better. They have not. <laughs> and even modern Jeeps aren't built for a desert like the Gobi. We have an electrical problem and we don't know what it is. It's not a very complicated wiring plan of Russian it's Jeep. Sort of a, yeah, I don't know. Probably more reliable than an American Jeep. It's, you know, more than a, a, a Fiat Dodge Chrysler Fiat Jeep. Oy. It's not like a Japanese or American car. Yeah. They're up and running, but next it's a truck's turn. Oh boy. <laughs> 
Piston, huh? A lot of, I don't know, Dr. Murphy's, I don't think so. We think it's piston number six. A critical breakdown could have severe consequences. End of the expedition, if not the end of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people tell make it. it. Oh, God. With the nearest gas station some 500 miles away, and like time already getting tight, <laughs> things will have to go smoothly from now on. Oh, we're having some mechanical problems. We, oh, excellent, we think gravity. it's a fuel pump. Yeah, sure. I can't wait to see you. Could be way bad. See what you. Uh, you know, it seems to me I translation got to stay in cool. there without doing that the twisty deal. <laughs> Maybe we'll tow it or oh, abandon it. Abandon it. Get on and try with it. it. We'll go for it. The, hey, the Kelly Cakes, how are you doing? Welcome back. Day. Good to see you. After more than 12 breakdowns, oh, the vehicles boy. all decide to run at the same time. Oh, man. As they enter the dusty dinosaur fields of the Gobi, they're traveling a long way backwards in time. Yeah. Dinosaurs first appeared some 230 million years ago in a world with a different face closer to like 240 honestly the creatures were thriving a hundred million years later as south america and africa split apart about 75 million years ago in the late cretaceous period and this is funny how it uh like the continents are just kind of drifting but you don't see sea levels rising or falling like italy is just there since the beginning of time like, it wasn't wasn't really like this um yeah here this is uh this isn't perfect but a lot better yeah let's go back to 240 million years ago around the time of the first dinosaurs um yeah this still tries to you know show the outlines of modern day countries there just for reference but Go forward in time. Well, very much no Italy up there. <laughs> uh, Italy's modern shape is a recent innovation. It didn't used to look like that. Same with Florida, for that matter. You know? Keep an eye on Florida there. It, uh... Yeah, any kind of a land peninsula like that. It's going to be one of those things that it changes a lot through time. Yeah. Florida comes and goes. Yes, absolutely, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah. Florida here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, and Finder, yeah, shoot, India. Right here. Having once been stuck to the side of Gondwana there. You know, it starts to begin its journey up north, and it moves at an incredible speed, geologically speaking. Look at that. Wow, and then it crashes into mainland Asia, and uh, pushes up those Himalayan mountains. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and thank you, Dino Wolf. Let's see. What is this here? Oh. Oh, Andrea Cow. Interesting. You got this published. Well, well, well. That is going to be very interesting. Is it in English or in Italian, though? Uh, for my own sake, I hope it's in English. And it is. That's good for me. Um, yeah. 
Interesting. Cups name has been considered small and unspecialized to lure stores. Uh... Oldest Tyrannies? I think that's supposed to be Tyrannosaurs. There may be some translation. Uh... No! Manoraptor reformed Tyrannosaurid faunas. You're named Tyrannies. Okay, never mind. Not a translation issue. I jumped the gun there. Apologies. My fault. Interesting stuff. Huh. Huh. Oh, this is going to be neat. Well, well, well. Thank you, thank you, Dino Wolf. I really appreciate that. I am really looking forward to reading this cover to cover. I'll probably do that tonight. Stick that on the desktop there. Good stuff. Ooh, boy. Anytime we're talking about, uh... Ontogeny is a good time for me. You know? The changes that, that critters undergo throughout their... Ontogeny. Ontogenetic changes. These are... Pretty dramatic in a lot of dinosaurs. Ontogeny. And, uh... Thank you again, Dino Wolf. Good stuff. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Here, let's let's get back to our documentary here. Dinosaurs began to disappear, leaving only bones behind. Yeah. Their bones were more motionless than the continents. Then in the 1920s, Roy Chapman Andrews came to a remote place in the Gobi Desert he would name the Flaming Cliffs. It was a likely looking place. There appeared to be medieval castles with spires and turrets, brick red in the evening light, colossal gateways, walls and ramparts. A labyrinth of ravines and gorges studded with fossil bones make a paradise for the paleontologist. Without a doubt, there were hundreds of bones lying just beneath the surface. But where? If only my eyes could pierce that baffling surface and get a glimpse of what lay concealed. Within minutes, they were finding fossils. Andrews and his team had stumbled onto the mother load of dinosaur bones. They discovered the remains of some 200 different animals, many of them completely new species. The fossils revealed a world that Andrews found alien and terrifying. Dinosaurs were the sort of creatures you might think of as inhabiting another planet or the kind you dream of in a bad nightmare. It was an image our culture nourished for generations. Dinosaurs were fierce, monstrous. And not all that right. Yep, we're gonna Many of the new ideas about dinosaurs are coming from the amazing boneyard called Ukatolgad. The team discovered the site three years ago. Now, to get to the dinosaurs, all they have to do is find it again. The maps in general are pretty lousy for the Gobi Desert. The towns on those maps are myths in many cases. We don't even pay any attention to any of the roads marked on those maps. They're completely wrong. Even a satellite tracking system doesn't always help. So the satellite may know where you are, but the road you need may be in a completely different direction. So 
it's the roads here are very confusing. There are no signs, and, and many of them lead nowhere. Mandalobo. Mandalobo is here. So we're going to go, go like this. Yeah. We're a little off course. We're not really lost. We're just a, we're just a bit off course. So we've got to go this away and that away. At times, you have to go in circles to move forward. And Dino Wolf, just search dinosaur documentaries on YouTube. That's literally the name of a channel with a bunch of different paleontology documentaries. Roy Chapman Andrews, too, spent more than a few days wandering the Gobi. You know, but in the way. end, he blundered into a discovery that stunned the world. A member of his expedition literally stumbled across a critical link in the great chain of being. There you go. On July 13th, George Olson reported that he had found some fossil eggs. We did not take his story very seriously. <laughs> Nevertheless, we were all curious enough to go with him to inspect his find. There could be no mistake. Our paleontologist finally said, gentlemen, there is no doubt about it. You are looking at the first dinosaur egg ever found. Which... Wasn't it actually the case? There had been dinos <laughs> dinosaur eggs found previously in France, long before this, but no one really made a big deal out of them. And there were, you know, fossil egg dinosaur eggshell fragments found in Montana way back in, like, 1903. Uh, so, like almost 20 years before this. But nobody made a big deal out of those either. These are the first well-publicized dinosaur eggs ever found. The discovery made Roy Chapman Andrews a national hero. But the eggs were not alone. Lying above the nest was a bizarre skeleton, yeah. a bird-like dinosaur unknown to man. It had apparently been caught in the act of murder, stealing the eggs. So it was forever cursed with the name Oviraptor, Latin for egg thief. Yep. It so would be critter... years before we discovered the strange truth about the animal called Oviraptor. This animal was first published in 1924, November... 19th? 1924? When was that? Let's look it up real quick. And that paper is important for today's discussion because this, everybody, is the same exact paper in which Velociraptor was first described. Velociraptor? Oviraptor and Sauronithoides, I believe. All in the same paper. November 7th, 1924. Which means that this coming November marks 100 years of Velociraptor. And we'll be having a celebration for that, I am sure. That is going to be pretty neat. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that should be the real Velociraptor Awareness Day. I don't know why it's some random day in April. Why is it April 18th? I don't know. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, November 7th, when Velociraptor was first published. Yeah. Uh, the first dinosaur of the typical megalosaurian type, although of small size, seems to have been an alert, swift-moving carnivorous dinosaur which the generic name Velociraptor is applied. Then you've got Sauronithoides, the bird-like theropod, and then Oviraptor, the egg seizer, egg thief, egg robber. Didn't actually steal eggs as far as that, but yeah. Yeah. And Daisy McGar, uh, this documentary is... What is it called? It was a National Geographic one, I think? Um...
wasn't Dinosaurs of the Gobi. It is... There we go. Uh, it is called Dinosaur Hunters Secrets of the Gobi Desert. Here, I'll pull up the IMDb page for you, too. There we go. Yeah. And this has got a special place in my heart because back when I was working in the Hell Creek Formation with Denver Fowler and John Scanella and other people from Museum of the Rockies, we would watch this sometimes. And if we would get rained out one day, you know, it's just hammering down with rain. We can't go out and dig. We're just going to sit around camp. And then Denver had this on his hard drive on his computer. Uh, on his little external hard drive there, and so we watched this. And so, you know, a group of paleontologists watching an old documentary about another group of paleontologists out digging there in the Gobi. Got fond memories of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, boo, 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 la. Good stuff. Um, now, fast forward from that, in 1996 to a more modern understanding of Velociraptor. Uh, I often play this if we get a big raid or something. Do I really need to play it for, for you folks right now? Um, prehistoric planet Velociraptor. Here, let's just look at the screen time of Velociraptor in Prehistoric Planet. They did a wonderful job portraying this animal, although that claw is too curved. Too curved right there, I think. I don't think their claws were that curved. A Velociraptor. Because velociraptors often hunt together. Uh, it kind of bugs me when they just... Oh, it's like, oh, screen time things. These videos where they just edit them into oblivion so that... Yeah, here. Let's take a look at this. This is going to be better. Huge stands of poplar trees mark its arrival with a flush of nutritious leaves. Oh, interesting. Okay. A magnet that draws many in the hungry camp? animals. Oh. Long-necked nemectosaurs are joined by Mongolian titanosaurs. Hmm. Not been named yet. And with them, much smaller Prenocephaly. But one thing stands in their way. This immense plateau. And the only way to reach the forest is through this maze of canyons. I wonder if this is a real life location. Where it is. Looks like it could be somewhere in North Africa. As they enter, the herd becomes nervous. It's a good place for an ambush. Velociraptors are waiting. <laughs> Much more modern depiction of Velociraptor in this. It's lovely. Really good stuff. No other creature in the world looks like a half plucked turkey and walks like a pot bellied bear. But Red Zed does. Thank you for the 19 months, Red Zed. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for keeping me online for that long. Appreciate the support. Yeah. Um. Oh, and very cool, Daisy McGarr. 
Your dad mostly did movie trailers as one of the big voices of Fox and ABC. Very nice. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But they can't possibly tackle a titanosaur. And happy Velociraptor Awareness Day to you too, Mariko. Thank you. And uh, sweet dreams. Hope you have a good evening. Yeah. Success will depend instead on other hunters on the prowl. membrane i love that ah i love that they kind of called attention to that there that sideways moving you know like clear eyelid just like modern look 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 yeah very cool crocodilians have that as well there's been an arc Asia's version of Tyrannosaurus Rex. And yeah, so we don't really... There's kind of two major trains of thought on Tarbosaurus and its relation to Tyrannosaurus. Some dinosaur paleontologists think that Tarbosaurus is the direct ancestor of Tyrannosaurus, which uh, would be kind of tricky if it turns out the Namekt formation really is so much later if it is right up near the KPG boundary. Um, but there's another idea that Tyrannosaurus is uh, like more homegrown, that it it evolved from Despletosaurus earlier in time in North America. Those are kind of the two main ideas. Oversimplified, of course, but yeah. They don't really take a, a position on that in this documentary. As the predators approach, panic spreads. Only the Pranocephaly can escape to higher ground. Is what the velociraptors have waited for. Now the velociraptors can finally spring their ambush. Working together, they have secured a meal for the whole family. The carbosaurs have also had success. For predators, it's actually a time of plenty. Baby velociraptors. And for the velociraptors, the perfect time to start a family. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess we'll go over this, even though we haven't gotten a big raid or anything, but it'll be a nice way to kind of lead into Thursday Bird's Day here. How do we know that Velociraptor and its relatives had feathers? They put together a lovely kind of behind the scenes prehistoric planet featurette here. Boo, 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 so let's take a look at that. There we go. Uh, anywho, yeah. And Catabriggles says, What did dinosaurs do besides hunt, eat, mate? I mean, 
migrate, socialize, dig burrows, uh, you know, communicate with one another, and do all kinds of stuff. Do a lot of sleeping. Um, probably playing around. Yeah. Just like animals today. Clubs, town halls. Sure. The bones of dinosaurs are often very well Swimming up waterfalls. No. But that's not the case with the skin or the soft parts. So imagining what they looked like has been largely a matter of guesswork. But now some truly exceptional McCoy, yeah. fossils have been discovered <laughs> that have changed all that. One of the most startling discoveries has been the presence of feathers on a large number of species, including Velociraptor. Yeah. The idea that dinosaurs like Velociraptor were fully feathered is no longer at all controversial. We currently know of about 60 dinosaur species that are completely covered in feathers, just like yep. modern birds. Some of the most perfect fossilized feathers have been discovered in China. This is an image of a specimen that was found in 2015. It's called Zhen Zhuolong. And you can probably guess from these huge claws on its feet that it was related to a velociraptor. And Trichibobus, yeah, generally big herbivores need more plant material than that in kind of a greener area. I think they were supposed to be migrating from one place to another in that clip that we just watched. I think that was supposed to be the story there, but it does seem an awful desolate place for you to have so many big sauropods walking around. Like, how many days would they have to go without food there in order to make that, that traversal? Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are animals that were warm-blooded, so they would have had to feed pretty frequently. Uh, I would imagine, you know, yeah. But also, you can see amazingly perfect detail of feathers mm. down its tail and more on its arms, its wings. For Velociraptor in particular, fossils have even been found with indentations in the bone. Yep, quill knobs, as we Showing call. exactly where feathers would have been positioned. Yep. So it would have looked very... So the question is, if these animals couldn't fly, because they were too heavy to fly, Velociraptor was not a flying dinosaur, why did it have wings? Why did it have what are essentially light feathers? on its arms. There's a number of different ideas about that, but I think there's one that seems to make the most sense. We'll talk about that. Uh, the South American Titanosaur recording of Yeah, I can. That just out in the middle of like a salt flat or something. Uh, yeah. How how long would they have to go without food in a place like that? And uh, Telka Bear, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontalica. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very different from that scaly monster that we're familiar with. It would have been coated in lots and lots of feathers and would have looked a lot more like a kind of really terrifying turkey. And again, I see this every time we watch this video. I think that's a mischaracterization or like a missed opportunity. Don't think of it like a turkey. Think of it like a giant ground running eagle or a hawk or something like that. That's the correct vibe for this animal. It's a predatory creature. Big raptorial claws. Yeah. It's a bird of prey, essentially. Yeah. The fossil evidence for feathers may be clear and incontrovertible, but why would a flight like a shark, but like for, yeah, there you go. Yeah. need feathers in the first place? Golden eagle vibe, yeah. Or like another kind of bird of prey that I just... Uh, I was watching a David Attenborough documentary last night, actually. And he introduced me to the... Larger than a golden eagle, a white-tailed eagle. 
Uh, these are starting to come back to the UK after being persecuted. They may have even been drink driven to extinction there. Extirpated. But they're coming back. They are bigger than golden eagles. And they will just take geese right out of the air. Uh, they were... They were hunting down uh, barnacle geese. It was wild stuff. So, you know... If you're thinking about Velociraptor or Deinonychus or Utah Raptor, an eagle is probably a pretty good kind of, uh, you know, it's going to have similar vibes to one of these dromaeosaurs. It's top predator, big raptorial claws. That's what you should be thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And do they eat goats off cliffs and land on pronghorn and peck them to death? I don't think these guys do, because they don't live near pronghorn. White-tailed eagles? But golden eagles do. As you well know, Ken. That's why you said that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah can I find a clip of... of that? Let's see. White-tailed eagle. Um... And blood rain for two years. Thank you for the follow. Thanks for dropping in there. Appreciate you clicking that follow button. Yeah. I'm not finding this here. Uh... Anyway, suffice it to say, white-tailed eagles really, really cool. They get even bigger than golden eagles, at least in the UK. And, uh... Yeah. Ah, uh, this is pressure. If you're imagining dromaeosaurs... John! John! Way to imagine. It's Marvin! Your cousin, Marvin Barry! Moonrise you Rabbit, is that you? you found you looking for! sound moonrise rabbit i hope you had a wonderful stream how are you doing it is wonderful to have you here thanks for raiding in howdy howdy and moose not mooses how are you doing welcome welcome moonrise rabbit tell me how your stream went doing some making makers and crafting hope it went well welcome back happy velociraptor awareness to you happy velociraptor awareness day to you we are trying to be aware of velociraptor and other feathered dinosaurs of right now. Yeah. A downy coat may soften their image as scaly reptilian killers, I don't think but no. in fact feathers would have made Velociraptors even more deadly. Yeah. Allowing them to attack unsuspecting prey where no other hunter would be able to venture. When we look at modern animals, we see that feathers are useful for so much more than just flying. Sure. For an animal like Velociraptor, feathers would have helped to control movement, particularly when the animal was leaping, climbing, or changing direction during a hunt. Feathers can also function as a kind of suit of armor, providing protection from the blows of prey. Yeah, as well predators. as from collisions with the environment. And that would have allowed them to succeed even in the most difficult terrains. Yeah, what they didn't mention here was what I think is a hypothesis that makes a lot more sense than, like, parachuting with feathers. And that's the, like, raptor prey restraint hypothesis. Um. Where did that go? Here it is. Yeah, we'll 
when we're talking about that thickle claw of Velociraptor and the other Dromaeosaurs. You know, this claw like this. this is about a little bit smaller than life size here. They've got this big hypertrophied claw on the digit two of their foot, so not their their big toe is is that's the hallux, that's kind of the dew claw, and then you've got digit two right there. And that's this big claw on Velociraptor. Why do they have that? And why do they have wing? And do those two things have anything to do with one another? It had been kind of a mystery for a long time. What are they using this big sickle claw for? And, uh... Zevin says, for climbing incline surfaces or trees? I mean, animals that have that today don't use them for climbing trees or incline surfaces like that. Especially when it's a claw that's not meant to contact the ground. So... Yeah, so here's a, a Scott Hartman skeletal reconstruction of Velociraptor mongoliensis there. And the way that that second toe is, is built is it's supposed to be held off the ground to help keep the claw nice and sharp like that. So my old crew chief, Denver Fowler, he was trying to figure this out, and he decided that he was going to look at modern birds of prey to see if any of them have got an enlarged digit two claw, and he found that several of them did. And uh, he published a paper on that, which got some interesting attention, including from this webcomic. XKCD about like science and language and math and stuff. We look at this all the time, but we're gonna do it again real quick. Uh, so it starts off and there's, I guess like a hip young woman. There's a little girl reading some dinosaur books. She says, what are you reading about? Dinosaurs. Oh yeah, they've gotten all weird since when I was a kid. They used to be awesome, but now they all have dorky feathers, right? He goes, yep. This says here, they now think raptors, dromaeosaurs, used their wings for stability, flapping to stay on top of their prey while hanging on with their hooked claws and eating it alive. And there's a citation for a paper about the show. Fowler et al. 2011. <laughs> she sits down and starts reading too. I love this for a number of different reasons. Not just because it's referencing research from my old crew chief. Important research, I think. But also, it's it's kind of a celebration of how cool dinosaur science is and how wrong people are when they go, oh, you know, dinosaurs used to be cooler. Like, no, they get cooler the more that we learn about them because dinosaurs are just inherently cool. The closer we get to the truth about what dinosaurs actually looked like, how they behaved, how they evolved, everything else about them, the cooler they become. like a beautiful encapsulation. Here's that paper. Uh, the Predatory Ecology of Deinonychus and the Origin of Flapping in Birds. I'll give you a link. This is open access. No paywall there. But, uh, yeah, the idea is basically that these animals, like modern birds of prey, will do. They will use their wings to kind of flap and stay upright as they're pinning their prey to the ground, using those big digit two claws. And then they're just eating it while it's still alive. This is something that modern birds of prey do called stability flapping. It makes a lot of sense for animals like this that can't fly, but do need to catch prey. They do have these huge claws and they have wings. It's the best explanation that I've heard for uh, for what's going on with these animals. Yeah, it's neat stuff. It's neat stuff. Yeah. Um. Yeah. If you're interested in this, I recommend reading the paper. Um, Denver strives to write in a way that's not too opaque. 
got this big soapbox about he talks about it all the time about how he thinks there's too much obscurantist language in a lot of scientific literature. He tries to write in a slightly more simple way so it's more accessible to interested amateurs or anybody who wants to read it. And I think he does a good job of that. Yeah. So check it out. It's good stuff. Anyway. Um. On Yeah, Astronomy Show. Yeah, and that documentary I was watching last night about those eagles eating the barnacle geese. Oh boy. And they strip all the feathers away from the, their necks and then they're just tearing into them. It's just. It's grisly stuff. It is grisly stuff. Um, and yeah, Finder Keeper, yeah. Scientific writing can be kind of, especially writing an abstract, can be kind of a, almost a form of art. In a way, it takes an interesting skill set. Anyway, speaking of birds, and very bird-like dinosaurs, it's Thursday. And Thursday means Thursday Birds Day. So let's get started here with Thursday Birds Day. <laughs> Hold on, something's coming, something's coming out of here. Look, there's a bird, dude, it knows what's good. I'm telling you, I just heard it inside. Thursday Birds Day. Birds are all around us in everyday life. But most of the time we hardly even notice them. Thursday Birds Day is a step toward correcting this oversight. Do you want to be part of Thursday Birds Day? I don't know. Here's how you can contribute. Go outside during the week and pay special attention to the birds around you. See if you can take a picture of a bird. It doesn't have to be a good picture, any old photo will do. Upload the picture to the Discord, and we will discuss it on Thursday. Simple as that. Thursday Birds Day is an invitation to go outside and appreciate the grandeur of the natural world. It's a reminder that, since birds are theropods, dinosaurs still enrich our daily lives. It's great! And finally, it's a celebration of the amazing history of life on our planet. So, happy Thursday Birds Day! Well, happy Thursday Birds Day indeed, everyone. Let's take a look at some of those photos that everyone has submitted here. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. And Grim Deviant, uh, so Velociraptor's claw, it's just, there's like a, that toe kind of goes up like that, and the claw could flex along it. It's, um, it's not fixed like a rooster's spur. It's different from that. Yeah. Anywho. First off, we've got Lenina here. You first this week, Lenina? Very nice. Gojira's is best bit of my Thursday. I'm glad to hear it, Gojira. I'm glad you enjoy Thursday first. Yeah. Um, on our drive back from Austin, Texas, Blue and I stopped at Bucky's and bumped into this gorgeous grackle. He was trying to do his best to woo a nearby female with his puffy screm song. I'd have done a video instead, but it was extremely windy, so the sound would have been awful. Well, appreciate you being considerate about that, Lenina. And look at him. He's just singing his heart out there. Beautiful. For our third, our first Thursday Birds Day Bird of the Week. Let's uh, let's look them up on our Tree of Life. Grackle. Here we go. Genus Quiscalus. Probably a common grackle, I'd imagine. Uh... Alright. 
And there we go. Common Grackle. Quiskalus. Quiskula. And the sixth recognized species of Grackle, apparently. Pretty neat. And there we go. Thank you, thank you, Lenina, for posting. Again, just like the narrator said in that video, a Thursday Birds Day bird doesn't have to be anything exotic. Doesn't have to be anything too off the wall. Doesn't even have to be a remarkable photo or anything. It could just be... Whatever. As long as it's a bird that you saw, you photographed, or maybe a sound recorder or videoed or whatever, that is what's important. And, uh... makes this accessible and fun, I think. You know? Um... Give me a second here. Let's see... There we go. Good stuff. Um, and Grackles were a holy bird to the Aztecs. And look at them. They had uh, this incredible empire. They're doing something right. <laughs> um, for as long as it lasted, you know? Uh, Charcone's got a brown thrasher having a thrash. Yeah, good stuff. That long beak on a brown thrasher. I wonder what they're related to. I would guess maybe like uh, starlings or something. But we're going to find out. We're going to find out. Good stuff. A brown thrasher. Well... Brown Thrasher, how far are they from Grackles? Okay, they're a good distance away. They're actually really far away. Wow. <laughs> okay. Nice. Toxostoma. What a cool genus name. Toxostoma rufum. Yeah. Toxostoma rufum. Rufum, but I hardly know him. Uh, next to other thrashers there. American thrashers. Very cool. That's a neat bill on that one. LeConte's thrasher. Pretty neat. They're related to mockingbirds, it seems. Well, well, well. Makes sense. It did sound kind of like a mockingbird. This one here. Very nice. It is kind of Mockingbird-esque in the call there. Thank you, Tricone, for posting. Good stuff. Yeah. And see that with how they hold their tail? Yeah. Long tail, kind of stiff like a Mockingbird. Dinosaur Dave has got an emu for us. Well, well, well. A young emu. A little one. Very cool, Dinosaur Dave. That is awesome. Love me some ratites. Uh, just walking around there. Several of them. Nice. There's some older emus. Mature ones. Very cool. One of my very favorite birds. That's awesome, Dinosaur Dave. That's really cool. Um, thanks for posting. Oh, emus are wonderful. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, oh, Read in an old timer reporter voice? Okay. <laughs> uh, War Reporter Dinosaur Dave reporting from inside the prisoner camps of Dromaeus Camp 13. 
Here you can see several of the prison guards patrolling around, making sure the prisoners uh, of the Second Great Emu War are restrained and cannot escape. The solo one is Baramil. He knows nothing about what's going on. I'm going to try and escape and get back to my road trip. Be warned, the war rages on, and one day we will have victory over our theropod oppressors. We'll see about that, Dinosaur Dave. <laughs> I don't know. I think their uh, their reign might continue unabated. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Um, and mommy does look at this dramatic photo. Holy cow, that's wonderful. These guys absolutely refused to get out of the way. We almost came to a full stop before they hauled their squirrel prize out of the road there. R.I.P. That squirrel. Um. Yeah. But yeah, these are black vultures here. Not turkey vultures, but black vultures. I can tell by how they are. Uh, yeah, we're eating here. Look at Jerry, yeah. <laughs> the ragdoll squirrel. Uh, poor squirrel. Uh, well, that squirrel died. So these vultures might live and eat a meal. Yeah. That's a look. This is a fantastic photo. All four of them in frame. Just the composition is beautiful here. I love it. And the squirrel. Oh man, this could be on the cover of National Geographic. You know? <laughs> Almost. Um, unironically, though, this, that's a beautiful photo. I love that. Here, let's jump from Brown Thrasher to Black Vulture. I think vultures are close to the Ecyptorids, aren't they? Close to hawks and eagles. They are birds of prey. They're closer to hawks and eagles than either of them are to uh, falcons, I think. Yeah, Black Vulture here. Corgyps Atreides. Yeah, so they're kind of close. To, they're close to the turkey vulture. Plus the secretary birds, ospreys, kites, and hawks, goshawks, etc. Very cool. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, hawks. Apparently, all of these are hawks. Vultures are a kind of hawk. Acyptoriformes. Is a acyptoriform like? Is that equivalent to hawk? Is that? I know hawk is not really a scientific term, but yeah, zipper is cool, very cool. Yeah. Anyway, beautiful photo there. I love it, mommy does. That is superb. Yeah. Squirrel. Squirrel, poor squirrel. Uh, Accipiters, thank you, Neverwinter. That's the that's the word I was looking for. Uh, I'd like to see these tick up here. Two squirrels. <laughs> Somebody else just clicked that. Real fun. Um, and Dr. Tara has got a social flycatcher reminding us about the local wildlife. Cocodrilo. De Pantano. Que no hacer, no acerrar tus mascota a la orilla, no nadar, do not swim, no alimentar, it's that like don't feed them, no pescar, do not fish there. It's a beautiful bird though, social flycatcher. That's lovely, and this crocodile sign reminds me of. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, 
Crocodiles do not swim here. Perfect place to go for a dip. Because we know the crocodiles don't. Uh, um. <laughs> Sign posted by the crocodiles, says Steely Dan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. Crocodiles do not swim here. Go for it. <laughs> it is asking crocodiles not to it's swim there? Completely right? flat. The bone wall is so oh, thin, it's about the same dimension as the wall of a dirter. A dirter is one of those things you get at the end of the paper towels, the cardboard thing in the middle, you go dirt, dirt, dirt. Well, that's what this thing is like. Dracu I don't have any personal photos to share, but I would like to share a bird from the Connell Lab website, the pheasant cuckoo. Could I share the link? Go for it, Dracu. Thank you for asking so nicely, and thank you even more for your nine months of support. It means a lot to me. Thanks, thank you, thank you. Um, anyway, I can't wait to go here this summer and swim there. The crocodiles don't swim there. Uh, <laughs> and there's so many different ways to interpret this. The cro the alligators want the, sw the swimmers for themselves. No crocs wanted. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And, Dracula, let's look at this. Peasants. Bukel. Here's something stranger than science fiction. Prehistoric fact. And Scott's RB, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontology. Good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, this content is available exclusively to Birds of the World subscribers. That's not me, but... You know what? We can look this bird up. On the old YouTube. Let's see what's going on with them. Oh, we've looked at these before. Well, well, well. Is there no sound on this one? Oh, there is. A lovely bird. Yeah. I wonder where they're from. They are pretty. Yeah. Um, let's look them up here. Thentropus. What a cool genus name they've got. Yeah. Pheasant Cuckoo. Least concern, good for them. They're doing well, it seems. And they're from Australia, Timor, and New Guinea. Well, well, well. Beautiful bird. Thanks for sharing, Draco. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, but Dr. Terry's got a social flycatcher for us there. And look at that lovely bird. Look at that. That's beautiful, too. Social flycatcher. Let's look them up on our tree of life. Here we go. Way over here. This one looks a bit young here. Rusty Margin Blackhatch. <laughs> Some of these common names, I tell you. Uh, but yeah, Kiskadees. Who said it looked like a Kiskadee? Neverwinter says looks similar to the Great Kiskadee. You bet. Yeah, and Kingbirds. Okay, Eastern Kingbird. Phoebes are close to these, right? Like Black Phoebe. Um, we have those here in California. I saw some up near Sacramento this weekend. I think it was a Phoebe and not a Kingbird. Yeah. Anyway, cool stuff. It's a beautiful bird there, Dr. Terra. It's a beautiful bird. Very nice. Uh, Hiptacular Raptor, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. 
And Salamander says, I sound like a frog, but I saw a really cool bird on the way home from work. I'm thinking Osprey. Ooh, well, well, well. That looks like an Osprey, oh, I think, yeah. It's so good a bird of prey. And uh, she's like, no. Looks but, like an Osprey to me. She said the smell of... It's an Osprey, I think. The smell of barbecue sauce all day long made me sick. <laughs> oh, buttercup. And that was like... Great footage from a moving car. You know what? Don't worry about it. You know what? You gotta about do what's, what's she right yeah, for you. She doesn't owe anyone an exp explanation. Just... Yeah. You don't owe anybody an explanation. It's Thursday Birdston. Celebrating Birdston. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely an Osprey. Awesome, Goodyear. Yeah, that's what I thought. So cool. Yeah, that stabilization they do is really neat. How they can just hover in place. And you know they're just peering down through the water with those eyes, looking for fishes, and then just... Vroom. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Osprey are so neat. Yeah, that hover is signature. Although I've seen Harriers do a similar kind of hover out on the prairie. This is not on the prairie, it seems, and that was not a Harrier. But, uh... But yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you, Salamander. That was, that was lovely. That was lovely. Out and about, you saw a bird. And he captured it. That's awesome. Well done. Yeah. Um, it's been a couple times right next to the bridge where you cross your bike. Cool, SV Harkin. Yeah, yeah. And, uh... Harriers can do that too, my bet. Yeah, like the the reason I remember is the the hair the was it shoot was the manufacturer of the is it Supermarine made the Harrier jump jet was it Hawker? No, I'm thinking Hawker Hurricane from World War Two. The Harrier plane. There you go, British or Yeah, yeah. What's the manufacturer? Harrier jump jets. Originally developed by British manufacturer Hawker Siddeley. It was Hawker, okay. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Came as a hurricane. Okay, gotcha, British story. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. Let's continue. Salamander, very, very nice. Very nice. Yes. Good stuff. And Lady Fiend, I'll try and watch this, but I can't guarantee it'll work. Um, a magpie! Yeah. Taking that cash. I'd say a black billed magpie, I think. We had these in Montana. Like, no, nope, that's blank paper. I don't want that. No. Give me that give me that money. And that squill. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Lady Feet. And Ms. Art rules. Heron and the polar bear habitat. Heron's asking for trouble, but you know what? I'm sure it knows what it's doing. Very nice. I love to see wild birds in a zoo. Just like hanging out. They're like, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to be here, but you know what? I'm a bird. I do what I please. You can't stop me. I'm a bird. <laughs> uh, I love it. Some of my Thursday birthday photos this week are uh, are from uh, from a zoo, uh, but they're not like birds that are in enclosures at the zoo. They're not they're not doing hard time. They're uh, they're only visiting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Andy's the one says best picture I got 
You can see its tail in the middle. Seen it this morning on a jog. It's the same type of bird that was on the old um, Bongo Kids Drink adverts. Can't say I'm familiar with that. Ooh, this is gonna be a tricky one. Spot the... Oh, here. Is that our bird right there? Did we get it? I think so. Yeah. Nice squared off tail. Kind of a bulky body. Who is that? I don't know who that is. Does anybody know, get that reference? Bongo Kids Drink Adverts. Well, we've got the internet at our fingertips here. Um, Bongo. Bird. Hmm. Can't say I'm, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, a toucan, I think others said for their... Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Anyway, thank you, Annie's, for posting. looking it was a bushy crested hornbill or a great hornbill holy moly that's awesome great hornbill forget what they're related to they're some of my favorite birds the hornbills are so cool I don't know, I don't know if it looks like a great hornbill but they are related to Cookaburras, really, and woodpeckers and toucans. That makes sense. Yeah. Related to king structures. Neat. Neat, neat, neat. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. And now, uh, Alexander Morrison says, this exhibit is present at the Miyaka State Park. Plentiful avian archosaurs, along with a pair of Testodines or testudines? I actually don't know how to... I've never heard that pronounced. Turtles and tortoises, yeah. Colonians. Colonians? I haven't heard that pronounced either. But some derived synapsids, mammals, and amphibians. This exhibit is one of the m many showing the wildlife species that inhabit the park's landscape. Others go into detail of the soil composition and surroundings and much more. Neat stuff. Oh, I love dioramas like this. Good stuff. Good stuff. I wish they had a bigger budget so they could actually have some, like, topography going on here instead of it just being flat, but that's still neat. That's still neat. Good stuff. This assortment of, uh, different critters here. Very nice. Cattle egrets, black crowned night heron. That's our city bird here. You know, snapping turtle, leopard frog. Very, very cool. Nice, Alexander Morrison. Very nice. Thanks for sharing. Good stuff. Yeah. You've never heard. Yeah. Is it Colonian or Chelonian? Kajira. Ka or Cha? I don't know. Shoot. I should ask Pat the next time I see her. Axman says, uh, Carolina Wren I found nesting in the paper slot of a mailbox. Oh, well. This species is known for choosing unusual nesting locations, including coat pockets and boots. A breeding pair often build multiple nests before selecting one to use. I love that. Like, hello. Knock, knock, who's there? Carolina Wren. Wait, why are you asking who's there? I'm knocking on... You're knocking on my door. Uh, yeah. Anyway, very cool, Axe, man. I love that photo. <laughs> you know, I will... I will raise you one mailbox there. 
Good stuff. Good stuff. Sometimes you gotta get creative with how That's a cool axe, man. I like that a lot. Uh, Carolina Wren. Let's jump to them. Carolina Wren. Good stuff. Wrens, Wrens, and more Wrens. Troglodyte day are the Wrens. Rock Wren. We used to see these all the time in uh, in Montana. I don't remember if I saw any last summer in, in Wyoming. I'll be on the lookout for these guys. Rock Wrens. They make kind of a lasery noise sometimes. Like, tsk, tsk. They're pretty cool. Yeah, anyway, wrens are neat. Wrens are neat birds. And they can choose some interesting nesting locations. I like that accent. Thanks for sharing. Uh, you love to build nests and hats. <laughs> Sculpin, that's awesome. And Mommy does this. Carolina wrens are a riot. They can be really bold about their nests. This couple from last year sent up an effective uh, set up inside an active car workshop. They stayed there with their babies through the welding and pneumatic equipment and hammering. Guess the safe covered location was worth the noisy neighborhood. That's really cool, actually. Good for them. Oh, that's super neat. Good stuff. Well, I just learned something. Carolina Wrens. Yeah, are there any videos we can find about Carolina Wren nests? Um, yeah. This video was made possible by Birds Walking Down YouTube channel, who provided <laughs> all the Carolina Wren footage you are about to see in this episode. A boat to sea. She's Canadian, isn't she? Yeah. The beloved Carolina Wren is one interesting little character known to nest in all sorts of very strange places, and it's even easily possible to attract them to a nest box. Huh. Mostly, these lovable birds are found throughout much of the east coast of the United States, but some hmm. live a little more central and also further north like Ontario, Canada. Unlike most birds that acquire a pair bond in spring, these little guys form relationships any time of the year. And once is established, the couple stays together until one of them passes on. It's till death do we part for these birds. Which wow. for this precious being can be as long as six years or more, since on average Carolina wrens can live six years in the wild. Wow, that's a long time for a bird All like year this. round, the pair live together on their territory, moving around with one another as they search for food, or aggressively scold intruders. <laughs> Good for them. When spring arrives, their interest turns toward looking for places to nest. Huh. Typically between April to July. However, southern birds begin as early as March. Usually, open cavities that are around three to six feet off of the ground in trees, overhangs, and stumps are what these wrens will use. These guys will also make use of abandoned hornet nests or old nests from other birds. Well, that's the wood at Carolina wrens. Most of the population love nesting close to people and are known to use all kinds of human-made things to construct their nest in. <laughs> the list is very Eight long pants? and can include places like mailboxes, flower pots, barbecues, coat Mail pockets, boxes. the cover to a propane tank, boots, <laughs> mops, helmets, even vehicles that haven't been running for a while. And the list just goes on. They are very versatile nesters. And Pretty whatever adaptable. you do, don't leave the garage door open or unattended. Carolina wrens are known to go into people's garages and sheds, too. So keep hmm. that in mind. If they get trapped inside, it could actually be fatal to them. Uh, yeah, Many people find them in a lot of weird places. If the nests are already done with eggs or nestlings, they have to be left alone until they fledge. Huh. Basically, this little rascal thinks it owns everything. But how could we get mad at that grumpy little face? Oh. Good stuff. This is one good reason to plan ahead of their nesting. Good stuff. Um, yeah, Carolina Wren, really neat. That makes me wonder, why does that species have such a proclivity toward nesting in unusual places? Is that like a cultural thing that's taught from generation to generation, or is it somehow inborn? Is that 
an instinctual thing that they have. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. And they go steely down, yeah. Yeah, pigeons and other doves. Their nests are famously, uh... <laughs> Shall we say, uh... Simple. Have you priced housing lately? Well, yeah, I know, right, Axman? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Now, from Steely Dan, finally a couple shots of this Robin that will not shut up ever right outside my apartment at all hours of the day and night. They are very vocal. Um, I just used the... There was a bird with kind of a weird sounding call the other day and I opened up my Merlin bird app and it's using the, the sound ID feature and it was a robin and then once it, it's like oh, okay of course it's a robin it sounded a little off for some reason but man are they noisy yeah um luckily Steely Den that should stop before too long I think they don't do this all year round so happy it's springtime you know just singing this little heart out. But good stuff, Steely Dan. Thanks for posting. Yeah. And Sadulo says some birds that came into my garden. A black red star and a great tit. Very cool. Is that a red star there? Black red star? Nice, nice, nice. There we go. There's that great tit. Very cool. Excellent. Yeah. Here, let's look up uh, red starts here. And look who came to say hello. Hello, Sweetie Pie. You want to come up here? And there's Moon Pie also. Wow. Uh, here, Rufus backed red start. Let's look at that. And you've never seen the robin used for Christmas? Oh, they're talking about European robins, Harry. European robins, since they're active in, during the winter in Europe. Uh, they're on all kinds of Christmas cards and stuff. Um, but here in the U.S., most of North America, um, robins are kind of a symbol of springtime. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, cool. Rufus-backed red start. That might be... Maybe not. Black red star. Let's try that. Hmm. Anyway, cool stuff, Sedulos. Cool, cool, cool stuff. Thanks for posting. Nicely done. Yeah. Yeah, and things that saw this Canada goose snapping in a puddle on my way into a restaurant. My mom calls them cobra chickens. Oh! Is that what somebody was referring to earlier? Cobra chicken? That sailed over my head. Canada goose. Brantic canadensis is this critter here. Branta canadensis, the Canada goose. Yeah. And Jedi Mega Man's got some emotes for the occasion. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Canada goose. They're lovely. They really are. Yeah. Sweetie Pie, do you want to come up here? Canadian Air Force, there you go, didn't cheer, yeah. Um, what's that? You want to come up here? Yeah. You know where to get the creeps. They're up here for you. There's a bunch of them here. Hey, stop looking at the door. Nobody's going to get you. Is 
that smell. Come get him up here. Well, we'll see if that entices her. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Would that be a cat trick? No, no moon pie yet. Uh, but here's sweetie pie. Hello, sweetie pie. Hello. Oh, my camera's broken. Is out of commission for some reason. That's frustrating. Yeah. Oh, sweetie pie. Crunching, crunching on those treats. And hello, Moon Pie. Do you want to come over here too? Moon Pie might make an appearance also. That would be a cat trick. All three cats in one stream? That's so odd. Why is this. It's never just refused to work entirely. Nah, that's frustrating. Oh well. And nope, this one doesn't have a lens cap, Gojira. Yeah. And that's this. The beliefs certain people have about birds. Especially like old wives' tales and stuff, it is pretty funny sometimes. Yeah. Anywho, let us continue with our Thursday Birds Day, Thursday Birds. A dinosaur with tiny baby Saurus. Oh, look at that Reganation. We've got a mother mallard. A little young there, ducklings. That is pretty cute. Thank you, Reganation, for posting. What do you think, sweetie pie? What do you think? Huh? Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh. Babies were tiny. They are super tiny, Regulation. They must be pretty new there. Very nice. Yeah. Um. And Jay Joyce says, an unspectacular video of one of the most spectacular birds in North America. The scissor-tailed flycatcher, Tyrannus porficatus. Oh, man, the tyrant flycatchers. They've got such cool, such a cool genus name, Tyrannus. This bird is more commonly found in the southwestern U.S., but this one showed up on an Amish farm. On an, in an, showed up on an Amish farm in Hunyata County, Pennsylvania, last week. And it has been a wowing Pennsylvania birders ever since. Well, well, well. Yeah, look at that. Whoop, whoop. Very cool. That is awesome. Here, let's, uh, let's find a video of a scissor-tailed flycatcher. So we can marvel at it together. Uh... Scissor-tailed flycatcher. Come on, YouTube, you could do it. Yeah, that's okay, Neverwinter. It's it's good stuff. Yeah. Um. Look at that tail. Look at that tail. Crazy long tail on this bird. Why? Hey, bird, why the long tail? <laughs> what, what pressure? It, it's, I wonder if it's a sexual selection thing. I wonder if the males have long tails and the females don't. Or, um, or whether it has something to do with aerodynamics. Whether it helps them catch insects in flight. Flycatchers are supposed to be pretty good at that. 
Yeah, that is impressive. It is almost like a Velociraptor tail, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah. Um... Is that the same bird? That is nuts. That's not the same bird, is it? American Bird Conservancy. It does look like the same one. Yeah, very cool. Oh. Tropical lowlands where they have. Interesting. That's a crazy tale. Very cool stuff. Uh, really neat. It's it's mostly tail there. You know? <laughs> I love how distinct this bird is. Just from its silhouette, you're like, yep, that can't be anything else. It's got to be a scissor-tailed flycatcher. So neat. Yeah. Very nice. Anyway, thank you. It was really neat. Neverwinter, excellent stuff. Uh, um, Miss Creation's got a sulfur-crested cockatoo at the Australia Zoo. This one was quite talkative and kept saying hello to me while I took the photo. Very nice, Miss Creation. Very nice. She's like posing for a portrait there. He's like... Yeah. I know I'm very interesting. Go ahead, take a photo. Happens all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff, Miss Creation. Thanks for posting. Lairtrop has got some kind of gall. What is this? I assume a juvenile kelp gall. Laris Dominicanus. Seemed rather friendly, spotted in town. Apparently it hangs out on the same corner around the same time every day. I'm gonna try to meet up again. Lair Trop, if you can get another photo next week, I will be impressed. Very cool. Juvenile kelp gull. Man, gulls are something. Yeah. Love them or hate them or respect them as I do. People have got opinions about gulls. Hard to identify. They hybridize easily in the wild. They, uh... The juveniles all sometimes look the same as one another. They'll eat the young of other birds. They'll eat human garbage. They'll eat all kinds of stuff. But also they are beautiful in flight. They're extremely adaptable. Gulls are just all around interesting birds. British Asura has got an old blurry image for some extra challenge. What is it? I don't know, but I took it at Shenzhen, Southern China Botanical Gardens. Looks like some kind of heron. Some kind of heron there. But who? used to dislike gulls, but you've come around on them like bitches. Nice, never wonder. Yeah. 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 And rusty-headed heron, says Gojira? Hmm. Tricolor heron. Or you're just saying it has a rusty head. That dark tip to its bill is interesting. Yeah. 
cool British this word. Cool, cool, cool. So maybe somebody will figure that out. John Ming says, this little guy kept coming back and tapping on my window and managed to catch it on video. Well, well, well. Trying to get in there? Or trying to fight with its reflection? What's going on there? Hmm. Maybe trying to sell you magazine subscriptions. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, I don't know who that is. That is interesting there. John Ming, I don't know who that is. Yeah. I'm trying to ask you about your car's extended warranty. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, oh, Chinese Pond Heron is a potential identity for this one. That would make sense. It's near a pond in China. It's a heron. Chinese Pond Heron. I think that's it. <laughs> I think that is exactly who that is. Yeah, I think we've got our our suspect. We have our culprit. Chinese pond here. Nicely done. They're never winter and Lenina. Yeah, yeah. And Murph. Chinese pond here and yeah. Excellent. Well done, Jim. Well done. Excellent. Um, and cool, John Ming. I don't, yeah, I don't, again, I don't know who this is, but. Long-tailed bush tit. Salamander. Let's see. Oh, really? Wow, I've never seen one of these before in my whole life. Interesting. Where are they native to? Found throughout Europe and the Palearctic. Okay. Huh. So from Eurasia and Northern Africa. Is that the idea? Uh, that's a pretty big range. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Cool. Cool. Thank you for posting there, John Ming. Yeah. Uh, cool stuff. On a recent walk around the lake. Oh, that looks like an American coot. Right? They sound like squeaky toys. They're, uh, they're charismatic little birds. And they've got those neat lobes on their toes. They don't have webbed toes. They just have, there. Oh, I'll show you in the, in the picture first. Yeah, see, not webbed, they're lobed. webbed, but lobed. The American coot. Funny critters. Yeah. So the lobes are for swimming. Petrichor. So their ancestors did not have webbed toes. And rather than just evolving webbing between them, instead they went in a different direction. They just have like this kind of clown shoe thing going on there. It's pretty funny. Yeah. And is that an Australasian grebe, really? This one here? It looks a lot like an American coot. But you know what? No, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, here. Um, let's see. No, I don't know. It does. Well, this guy's got red eyes. 
here. Um, Australasian Grebe? No. No, this is different. Yeah. To me, that... Yeah. That could be a red eye there. I think it is a coup. Yeah. Oh, Greaves have low toes too. Gotcha. Oh, okay, okay. That's what Rosanne was saying. Yeah. Eurasian coot. Oh. There we go. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Eurasian coot. Cool, cool, cool. Probably, uh, probably introduced, I would imagine. Eurasian coot. Uh, found in Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and parts of North Africa. Huh. huh. Neat. Neat, neat, neat. Thank you, Rosanne, for posting good stuff. Yeah. And Neil says it's Wilson's Plover nesting season at the seashore. Very cool. And, yep. They're, uh fostering the next generation. I'll say that. Very cool, Neil. Wilson's Glover. Let's jump from the Canada Goose to them. Uh, I think one of the birds is trying to jump over the other one, but he keeps getting stuck, Charlie's Dragon. Wilson's Glover. Sometimes they hang out near a big stick or a piece of vegetation. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff, Neil. Cool, cool, cool. Um, and Mayor Space has got a downy woodpecker spotted on my hike this morning. This very morning? On Velociraptor Awareness Day? Discord is not playing the video for some reason. Come on, you can do it, Discord. You can do it. Yeah. There we go. Downy Oh, very cool. So we get them constantly. Listen to that. Really neat. Good stuff. Oh, woodpeckers are so neat. It's crazy that it's a mechanical sound that the bird is making by bashing its beak against a tree. Us down it. Yeah. Um, and it looks like Zevin has got maybe our last one here. Zevin says, I'll post some stills I took a few months ago. May add a clip if I get to it. There's quite large in size and need to host them somewhere. Those look like trumpeter swans to me. Very cool. They are big, these birds. One of the, the birds with the largest wingspan in North America. I think it goes condors, then pelicans. I think white pelican, then brown pelican, then trumpeter swan, I think. And, but they might be mute swans. Oh, okay, okay. Interesting. And swans are related to, as you would imagine, ducks and geese. Um, the mute swan here. Yeah. The swan is the heaviest. Is that right, Gojiri? Interesting. Huh. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Cygnus Olor. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. So they're right here. It's the black swan. And the trumpeter swan. The Fooper Swan. Yeah. Good stuff. Very cool, Devin. Very cool. Oh, and there, in real time, our last one is going to be from Takahu. Emule on Twitch. Last Minute Birds. Yes. Uh, my first time seeing the Florida Scrub Jay. Well, well, well. That's on the cover of uh, my bird book. Which one is that? 
I would, uh, I would show you, but that, that camera isn't working right now. to restart my computer, but that's on the cover of this lovely book, The Genius of Birds, by Jennifer Ackerman, all about bird intelligence. Popular science book, really good stuff. Available as an audiobook as well. Same bird, Florida Scrubger. Uh, endemic only to the Sunshine State. There was a third bird in a tree over my head, acting as a sentry. These special little guys were hopping around, forging through the sand, mouths open in the heat. Yeah, cool it off there. Very cool. Oh, scrub jays are so much fun. I've seen a bunch of them. Really spectacular, spared no expense. And thank you, Reagan Nation. Reagan Nation gifted a tier one sub to Emuli. They I have given that, 202 you, gift subs in the channel. That's a lot of gift subs, Reagan Nation. Thank you kindly. Uh, good stuff. Scrub jays, beautiful. We get western scrub jays out here. Western scrub jays. California. I've seen a lot of them this week. These ones are a bit more svelte down there in Florida. It seems warmer in Florida. Makes sense. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Emulate, for posting. Excellent. Great photos. Though. Lovely. Let's let's embiggen this one here. Yeah. Look at that. Ah, uh, beautiful. Beautiful stuff. Uh, excellent. And, oh. Yeah, my earbud is about to die. That's, you know, this is a good stopping point. Don't go away. We're going to raid out. Oh, and it just powered off. Well, uh... Use the back of one. Yeah, we are going to go right into a bird channel. Probably Hoot House. Let's see here. Um, oh, wait. Zevin just add another batch? Oh, here we go. Yeah, those do look like cormorants. I don't know if they're double-crested or Brant's cormorants. Mm, very nice. Very nice, Zevin. You're close. I love cormorants. They're so neat. They're so neat. Stuff. It's for posting. And you know what? Why don't I show you some of the birds from this? I'll show you a bird from this weekend. I tried so hard to photograph this bird, and it was largely it just would not stay still. This bird. I think it's a tufted titmouse. But I'm not totally sure. Uh, this one looks more colorful than the one that I got. Also, much less blurry. But, uh... Looks like one to you, Mayor Space? Okay, cool, cool. Or it could be an oak titmouse. Really? It's not one I'm familiar with. It was definitely hanging out around some oaks. I think that's probably what it was. Yes! An oak titmouse. Very cool. Are these are these rare? Oh, but apparently they were only split between the oak titmouse and the juniper titmouse in 1996 due to the differences in song preferred habitat and genetic makeup. This one's from San Luis Obispo. That's not too far from where I was, I suppose. Santa Clara, California. Yeah, oak titmouse. Auburn, California. That's quite nearby. Excellent. 
Very cool. Very, very cool. Well, that's a first for me. That's excellent. And an excellent place to end the stream. So let's go ahead and uh, wish everyone a happy Velociraptor Awareness Day. And a very happy Thursday Birds Day. We are going to go check out some more birds here. Let's see who's live right now. We've got Hoot House. Yeah. Welcome, Hawk Baby Zephyr on Zoo, like the dinosaur? And Horus. Anzu is the name of an Oviraptorosaur genus. Oh, that is super cool. We're gonna go raid a raid food house live stream, and we're gonna check out some birds of prey as they, uh, I guess the the red-tailed hawks are gonna be passing the baton to the owls in just a. Right here, baby owls fledging. Oh man, this is gonna be cool. It's gonna be cool. Thank you, Lenina, for the stream. And thank you to everybody who's showing up here in our credits. Cheerers and gifters, subscribers, new followers, raiders, moderators. Thank you all for making this possible. Really appreciate your enthusiasm and your support and your questions and everything else. It's a big deal. And, um... for spending some time with me. I know the internet is a big place. There's a lot going on. I think it's pretty special that you spent this time here with me and with the rest of this community. So, thank you for that. And I hope to see you tomorrow for some more paleontology. Take care, everybody. See you later.